So just to kick off in terms of how the presentation will run, we will spend about 40 minutes just going through how infections and shedding some key findings from our research and the work we've been doing within the dropout space in South Africa. Um, I will start off by talking us through what some of those learnings and research has been, and then Ms. Biden will go into some recommendations we feel would um, help us to accomplish prevention of dropout and more importantly, the reduction of disengagement of learners within schools. So just to kick off, I'd like to say that we think about dropout as a process, and therefore we believe that it's a preventable occurrence. And you know, we, we know that the definition for dropout is not consistent nationally, and part of our recommendations today aims to address this by formalizing indicators and making dropout a, a key performance indicator itself. For us, it's extremely important that we consider dropout more holistically, so not simply just the inverse of throughput. Um, and so the presentation today doesn't necessarily only focus on matriculation or reaching matriculation or alternative pathways, but it is definitely about remediating what lies beneath um, the issue of dropout. And, and for us, that is learner disengagement. And we've spent a lot of time investigating global perspectives, national research, we've engaged the theoretical approaches, we've surfaced knowledge and experiences from the learners, educators, districts, provinces, um, and NGOs working in the space during this time that we've been doing this work. So really a ground up kind of methodology, um, you know, linking that to what the local perspectives are saying. And from our experience, it really isn't helpful at this stage to uh, pick apart any data sets which exist as representative of dropout nationally. Because the truth of these highly important figures is that it actually oversimplifies what is a truly very complex problem. And that problem for us is wrapped up into um, the vehicle of disengagement, which we're going to be discussing in more detail today. So the key aim of our campaign is really to halve the rate of dropout by 2030, which is in, la in line with the National Development Plan. And we've been doing this through days in awareness around what dropout and disengagement actually is, engagement and essentially preventing a dropout. And we've collaborated with NGOs and provinces across the country to test different interventions, including learner level data tracking, as well as psychosocial support responses. And we're going to be sharing that today with you. So what does disengagement look like? What is this thing that we are talking about? And disengagement is a term now being used globally to describe how learners are gradually affected by a process and an interaction of factors um, and lose the ability to focus in school. And these factors can be categorized into a group of push-up factors, which generally would act upon a learner's disengagement within a school space. Um, these things relate to issues such as poor teaching and learning or poor learner outcomes that relate to repetition, for example, or being an overage learner for your particular grade. All of these factors and issues that act upon a learner within the school space heighten their level, level of disengagement. The second set of factors can be categorized into uh, pull-out factors, which usually would act on the learner outside of the school space. And these can be linked to issues around community um, factors, as well as family factors, which are often entrenched in inequality or effects of poverty, and even you know, exposure or experience traumatic events or violence. And this further heightens the learner's disengagement. Now, in the past, when we've spoken about dropout, we've always referred to it as thinking that it is in direct relation to poor learner outcomes. And in fact, what we've learned is that that is not, um, that is an oversimplification and not exactly the case. And that the issue of dropout actually sits within the sphere of this disengagement that exists and is heightened for learners over a period of time. And because this engagement happens over a period of time, we have the opportunity to engage it and to re-engage learners before the eventual occurrence or consequence of dropout occurs. So on our screen, we have you know, one of the learners that we, we've spoken to in some of the work that we've done. And Amy Lee, who's now 21 and is from Lotus River, dropped out of school in grade 10. And if we really track back her experience of school, we can see how this engagement played a part in her dropping out of school and the fact that we didn't notice this disengagement for her and how these factors acted upon her life to you know, perpetuate the consequence of dropout. 
meant we weren't responding to it. And many learners like Amy are now regretting the, the impact that drop out on their lives and are struggling to re-engage or find pathways back into um, education or to attain a senior certificate if that's, if that's their goal. So we believe that solving the dropout crisis lies in providing ongoing psychosocial support with targeted support that is uh, that we are able to do by monitoring and tracking learner level data. So a real nuanced understanding of what um, you know learners are experiencing at a learner level in school and how that impacts this engagement. I want to spend some time just quickly looking at the loop between teaching and learning and learner outcomes and disengagement at present and how we're thinking about that within the school space and why we need to shift that thinking. So at the moment, currently we're viewing the cycle with teaching and learning as, a, as, as, as the pivotal and, and the main thing, which is right to some extent. And so therefore we plug in interventions to improve teaching and learning. However, we have found that disengagement and all associated factors is a root cause and not only for dropout, but for a range of other learner outcomes. And therefore, what happens is we are plugging these interventions into a negative cycle. If we switch this around and we use the same cause loop, but we prioritize the disengagement, uh, begin with interventions which focus on morale, psychosocial support, and ensuring engagement can happen of affecting positive change within the schools a loop. So we are therefore recommending that we focus on psychosocial responses that help us to address this disengagement and therefore the root causes that, um, that impact learner outcomes and, 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 and consequently drop out. And as well as then plugging in teacher and learn, teaching and learning interventions which have a better chance of having the impact of mis mitigating disengagement and ultimately preventing dropout because it will be formulated within a positive reinforcing loop um, in, in, in the way that these three factors engage with each other. So we can also see that this kind of approach is useful for thinking about learners who have exited the school system and need to be re-engaged back into the school system. Um, and it's also the kind of approach that's being championed um, globally now with learners that with schools having gone through the crisis of um, the pandemic. Uh, an example of a 15 year old learner in uh, East Cape, Eastern Cape, Nolutando, who left school in 2018, consequently became pregnant at the age of 15. You know, she was able to be re engaged back into the school system because of the psychosocial springboard um, that was in place for her through the connection with her mentor. Um, and so the, the dropout or the disruption in her schooling did not result in, 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 in a permanent dropout from the school space. Now, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about why South Africa's dropout is a crisis and, and how we're thinking about that. And then also how we're thinking about building a resilient education system um, and how we can institutionalize the stacking and the support that we are talking about when we talk about disengagement and when we actually deep dive disengagement differently. We'll also share some of the case studies um, from the interventions that we've um, implemented across the country. And then Ms. Biden is going to talk to you specifically around how these recommendations can be implemented looking at policy. So we'll spend about 40 minutes on the presentation and, um, and then we'll hand it over to you. So South Africa's dropout crisis, we know that around 40% of learners who start school in grade one will exit schooling, will exit the schooling system before completing grade 12. Now, Today, we must shift our focus to understanding what happens to learners who disappear from our schooling system, regardless of what that number is, because I know that also we don't currently have the, the data sets necessary to accurately define or reflect the extent of the problem. And so we need to start off by trying to do that, but not simply to quantify it, also to understand why it's happening and to understand and answer the question if disengagement with schooling translates into disengagement from life. So we know that um, this crisis or this, this dropout um, phenomenon is mostly normalized and pervasive within the schooling system because we don't see um, us talking about it in a way that helps us meaningfully understand if learners are able to meaningfully navigate their lives should they exit the school system at any point in their journey. Um, and I think the question we need to answer is, 
is if disengagement drives unemployment um, and, and is growing the number of already 3.4 million youth between 15 and 24 who are not in education uh, or, or employment or training. So understanding nationally that we need to have a coordinated response to tackling disengagement and re-engaging learners into this is a very interesting study that um, Van Brockhuizen and um, Dr. Van der Berg at Visa did, where they tracked a cohort of learners, uh, the 2008 cohort at learner level, to see how they performed through schooling. But what was interesting for me about this is that the learner level data um, also gave really good insights into how learners performed post schooling, so those that went into the higher education system. By linking and tracking the data across the systems, we were able to see how they managed to perform um, in, in that space and also able to draw conclusions and comparisons from Quantau 1 to 3 schools and Quantau 4 to 5 schools, um, different races, genders, and also using the wealth index to kind of tabulate um, how the learners perform against those kinds of ratios. And so the data at the learner level gives us the opportunity to not only identify this or identify the problem, but to some extent over time will give us the real mechanisms to be intuitive and start predicting and preventing the kinds of things we see happening within the broader space nationally. When we speak to schools and when we speak to teachers and learners, we often get the sense that dropout is very much accepted, that the idea that finishing school for everybody is not, um, you know, going to happen, is not, is, is not possible, seems to be pervasive. And this perception that learners often leave school because they are lazy or irresponsible um, seems to be prevalent. And for us, really understanding dropout is about understanding a child's mental state as they move through what is supposed to be an enriching experience in a place of safety. And currently we know that is not always the case. And we need to understand why. We need to understand why this is not working and on what level this is not working and how we respond to that so that education becomes more meaningful for all of our learners and educators. How do we do this? We definitely believe that early warning systems allow us to flag learners at risk, to identify this. We believe that proper data tracking and monitoring allows us to see if we are able to adjust that risk. So how we are, um, if our interventions are being successful in how we are moving learners through the system, but also if we need to shift our approach. And in fact, the psychosocial support that we are um, you know, distributing to learners or the services that they're accessing, if it is accurate and effective. Why this is so important now, just looking through a COVID-19 lens, is that we know the factors we spoke about earlier on in this presentation have definitely been amplified by the impact of COVID-19. So we know that from the first, first NITSCRAM surveys, 3 million people lost their jobs by April. We've seen the second study come out now, and it's showing that many of these people haven't been able to be in employment or access uh, alternate employment. And so the socioeconomic crisis will persist. And for many learners who were previously already identified as high risk learners in terms of disengagement, they may be dealing with additional uh, risk factors, and this risk may be amplified. And for learners who were flagged and, uh, previously, there might be issues now that they are navigating just because it's a fact is acting on the disengagement that we need to be aware of. And re-engaging learners back into the school space really speaks to this mental state that we're talking about, the psychology of engagement, being able to work with learners in a way so that they are meaningfully engaged in learning and that teaching and learning is able to take place. Um, when we talk to learners about the experience of the pandemic, this is the kind of responses we get and it really speaks to um, their understanding and their worry and the kind of mental state they'll be coming with and that's what we need to mitigate. So Cassidy 15 from Ottery can see has a desk and a space in which she's able to um, study and for many of our learners we know that that's, that, that was also not available and so for learners like Kanya who's up in KwaZulu Natal thinking about catching up becomes a worrying factor and becomes a factor that you know could heighten his disengagement without necessary support to hold him within the school space. What does it mean to have a resilient education system? And learner level tracking for us and data tracking at a learner level allows us to have an effective monitoring.
the system. And research has shown us clearly that this is what works in terms of preventing dropout. Learner tracking allows us to flag or alert officials when learners are at risk. And we've been doing some of this already within the country with some of our schools connected to the data driven districts um, by Michael and Susan Dahl Foundation and principals and teachers getting real time information in classrooms on a weekly basis around who the learners are they should be following up on and should be targeting. So before the disengagement is heightened to the extent that interventions are less likely to be successful, we're able to track this down and follow up with learners intensively. Um, and the three simple indicators to track in order to develop this risk matrix is academic results, behavior problems, and chronic absenteeism. Many of these indicators already exist in our school management systems. And this Biden is going to talk to you about how we can create uh, or strengthen these systems to be able to do this tracking in a much more intentional way. So this is what the ABCs is about. It's about flagging risk, identifying risk, and also allowing us to distribute our resources in a, in a manner that responds to that risk adequately. And in a space where resources are uh, constrained, this approach allows us to use that in a informed and evidence-based uh, informed manner. So the other part of this resiliency and this response really leads to efficient referral systems. And through efficient referral systems, we're able to get to learners in time. We have seen that through the interventions we've been doing in schools, that in spaces where a stable, positive emotional relationship exists for learners that are navigating high levels of disengagement, learners do much better to hold onto the opportunity of school. So we believe in creating opportunities for learners to build strong, loving connections with at least one adult. And through intersectoral collaboration, and wrap around support to learners who are at very high risk of dropping out of school and of disengaging from school, we're able to limit and decrease and reverse that risk. So some of our case studies, we work with four organizations currently across the country. It's a community action partnership work in the small town of Swell and Dam, um, in all of the schools in Swell and Dam, and they work together in a network. Masifumbani Development Group works in six schools in the East London area. Kula Development Group work in 22 schools in Farn and Stellenbosch. National Association of Child and Youth Care Workers work nationally, and the project they're working on with us is in the KwaZulu Natal region and within the Peter Maxwell district. I'm going to play a very short video on the reflections from um, the implementing partners that work with us um, as they share what that experience has been like and what they've learned. to group the six schools in this community together, two previous Model C schools and four now fee-paying schools, and get all of those schools on a set agenda, talking the same talk and walking the same walk. We call that the Change Makers Corporate. This group initially tackled dropout from a, can I say, combined effort to just get everybody aware of what it is, what the impact of dropout would be on our community. we've got hard data, the specific model component, is our access to data in schools and the, the currency and the relevancy of data. So with our early warning system, we've tried to flag learners. Initially, we did it through the admin system. So we wanted the secretary to be able to say, you know, populate this and it will tell us which learners are there, which learners are absent. 
send it through to the support region, our case is the NGOs, and see whether they can't follow it up. What we've realized in the two to three years focusing on this specifically is the, with the mandate to ensure that learning takes place, is actually the body that we need to empower to be able to flag learners at risk of dropping out. We work with seven schools in KZN where we have placed child and youth care workers and also trained LSAs as child and youth care workers to provide local psychosocial services. Our schools are in rural areas and some of our schools are in urban areas. Our schools and our learners come from under-resourced communities and most of our learners come from very poor backgrounds. When we first started working with the school, we realized that there wasn't much work done in terms of tracking and monitoring dropouts. Even though the registers were being completed, but they were not submitted on a regular. We then strengthened some of the services and some of the things that the school were already doing, like the register, the monitoring of the register through an SOP that we had developed. The SOP allows us to track a learner that is absent for more than three days and respond and intervene in cases requiring an intervention. Our development group worked in 20 preschools in five areas between Paul and Stalamash. We mostly work in Kwanza 1 to 3 schools that are characterized by severe poverty, alcohol abuse, gangsterism, and a lot of trauma. In our underground experience, we found that children as early as grade 3 permanently dropped out of the school system, and that the parents and the teachers didn't really view that as a crisis. we saw that the teachers didn't really mark attendance in their daily registers in a proper manner. Um, that also indicated not correctly on the report cards. We also saw that the children, a lot of children were deregistered after 10 days and that when without the consent of the parent or information to the parents and then when we wanted to get those children back into the school system, it was very, very difficult. Check and Connect mentors are trained on the evidence-based uh, data-driven model, which uses uh, indicators of, of school disengagement to monitor uh, learners that are exhibiting signs of dropping out. And then uh, mentors uh, work ex intensively with the learners, the teachers, as well as the parents of the learner to prevent the eventual dropout. Um, check and connect uh, model uh, monitors absenteeism, monitors class attendance, school attendance, as well as behavior and academic performance. With the work we do with the schools, we also partner with the Military Leaders Foundation in um, building the capacity of the schools in, in, in using the, the district based data uh, dashboard. Um, where they are now using the early warning system within the, 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 the data driven dashboard and are uh, monitoring uh, absenteeism as well as dropout in, in partnership with the mentor. implementing partners working within the different spaces have really unearthed the value of data tracking and used it to strengthen the already um, you know the, the responses that are already in place with schools and empower teachers and principals to have real-time data in their hands and to respond to problems and the risk of learners before it is associated with high risk or eventual dropout. Um, I'm going to just show you some of the results from some of the spaces. Um, before I go into the Check and Connect um, results, I will say that for the Community Action Partnership model, one of the key things that's come out of their work is that they've actually identified how to build a strengthened, a, a strengthened and functional um, school-based support team and to build a community-based support team that clouds in resources to, to add on to what the school-based support team is able to do and to intervene where district resources are under pressure. 
and they've been working as a community to be able to, to put that into place and to put that system of referral into place. And it has shown results in decreasing the level of risk for the learners that they identify and work with. The check and connect model has shown some results in terms of preventing dropout for the learners or decreasing dropout for the learners in the schools that they are working. I'm just looking at the high school results here over the period of 2016, 2017 and 2018. Um, and you can see that they've managed to bring that down to below 10% for the three schools that they've been in. Um, and also we know that from reflections from teachers and learners on the ground with this model in place, they find that having the, the crowded in resources adds to their ability to respond. Um, we also see that with Kula Development Group, the tracking of chronic absenteeism, that they've been able to bring down the learners who are at risk in their cohort, their attendance within school because they are held and they are followed up on. And so therefore they're able to engage with what it is they're needing to do within the school space. And this campaign approach that they've used has really been to bring the awareness to the community of Stellenbosch and Paul around the importance of attending school and then also to the teachers um, and principals around the importance of tracking the data intensely. Similarly, with the child and youth care workers who have been training learner support agents in KwaZulu Natal, the approach with tracking data has allowed them to tier the approach of the intervention into early intervention, full intervention, and whole school prevention. And so in a, in a district that is under pressure with resources, they're able to better allocate the services where it's most needed and to find ways to, uh, to work on prevention rather than just um, intervention as they go through the process of working with learners. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ms. Biden, who has worked with us extensively on developing the early warning system in our work with NLF over the, over the years, New Leaders Foundation, and the, um, and the investigation of the research and the data that we've done. Ms. Biden? Where is the person that's supposed I'm to? Yeah, thank you very oh. much Sorry for that slight delay. Um, okay, let's just check you. Everyone's getting a clear picture. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very okay, much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll jump straight in, in the interest of time. So I'm going to present a series of recommendations. And, you know, we understand that we, we sort of present this as uh, policy, but in all honesty, I think what we're definitely speaking about here is, um, you know, we came across a number of areas where um, policies are um, yielding results that might not be what was the intended result of the policy, which we all know happens frequently. But really, this is about implementation. As Mill has said, it's about crowding people into classrooms to be able to see that these things are done. Um, so just to give everybody a sense, I mean, this is, um, you know, we presented to you a lot of the stories that came out of the work that we did, but just to give you a sense that this has been a three-year project uh, taking an evidence-based approach to learning about school dropout. So a lot of the key methods and, and research projects, we've done a lot of correlation studies. Um, we've un uncovered a lot of the root causes of dropout and an analytic framework for that. Comprehensive reviews of the international as well as the local literature. Um, through really getting to grips with this data at the school level, um, which was sort of my role in the project, we were able to really find out not from the high level and retrospectively um, where the problem lies, but actually to be able to see and uncover a lot of technical issues with the data itself. So our first major recommendation is to make dropout reduction a KPI. One thing I can say from my experience working in government and also on this project is that there is um, a lot of effective monitoring that takes place when something shifts into the focal point of the interdepartmental accountability structures. Currently, the status quo is that we have seen an increased attention uh, on the problem of dropout with root causes being identified and addressed. I think this problem is definitely coming to the forefront because we have come to realize that it is drawing to a halt any attempts we have to achieve so many other KPIs uh, related to education. 
We see it in DBE's revised five-year strategic plan um, for 2015 to 2016. It mentions dropout um, and does place an emphasis on keeping learners engaged. Um, but there's no target identified. And it also, we, we frequently see, and I think a lot of this comes from the um, sort of making the household surveys our starting point, that it positions dropout as something that falls within a special need or some subset of learners. And our findings are very clearly that this is not the case. Learners can start with very good learning foundations and no particular special needs and disengagement can still occur from, you know, incidents in their, in their family or community life or even some incidents at school. So what we'd really like to see is to make dropout a KPI and set reduction targets. The um, committee, uh, uh, as I went through all the, the minutes of past meetings and I watched how the conversations took place to embed SSMs and just that engagement with the provinces frequently reporting back on how it was going with the universalization of SSMs. And from my review of um, EMIS all over the world, I think South Africa has done an incredible job to get an EMIS in place in a relatively short period of time and to get it universalized. Now it's taking that to the next level. And I hope that we'll see similar engagement um, in the meetings moving forward. So we need strategies to become an explicit goal. We really need the provincial um, departments to engage with this. I'm hoping that they would provide feedback in terms of the systems that they're developing. As I say, the infrastructure is largely in place. It's engaging with it on, an, on another level and particularly focusing on prevention, which is critical. We're hoping to see a strong focus on boosting learner engagement. Um, and as I say, an understanding that prevention is a mechanism to improve education outcomes. I remember when I was working in the treasury, you know, repetition frequently came up and I think there are things there that we need to shift and talk about. It's potentially another conversation. Um, learners over age. I mean, that all these things have different implications. Learners over age has budget, budgetary implications. Um, obviously, there are implications to, you know, all the throughput um, issues that we face with matriculation. And really just understanding that this could potentially be a root cause that could improve so many of those KPIs and just assist departments in saving money. Um, we also hope to see regular discussions about the care and support in schools function. We really hope that that can grow because prevention is a very, very difficult thing to implement. It's, it's very nuanced. Um, so it takes quite a seismic shift to get us there. Then the second thing is to really improve data and monitoring. So the status quo at the moment is that some data monitoring is taking place. And as I say, I mean, the, the, the development of EMIS over time and the, the universalization of SSMs, I think is really, you know, a feather in the cap of the, of the system uh, as a whole. Um, SSMs and CMIS both have been, have developed tremendously over the time period. Um, we've seen people, you know, standardizing the way that they collect data. We've seen a reduction in third party systems, not that third party systems are a bad thing, but we've seen much more um, cohesion in the way that data is being handled. Um, the problem is, is that there are major gaps. So until we have what we term interoperability between systems, um, you know, then it, it's actually impossible to track, to track learners and properly put a figure on dropout. There is some analysis and SMT feedback at the school level um, and the sort of gradual adoption of an evidence-based approach, um, you know, largely through the work of DDG, which I think is an excellent initiative of the Department of Education. But again, it's not sufficient. Um, at the moment, we're still getting to the point where, you know, data, you know, completion is the main target. And we really need to get to the point where people feel ownership of that data enough to build it into their feedback loops within the way that they manage education delivery at the classroom level. Okay, so the shift we'd like to see, so there's sort of three areas of shift when it comes to data and monitoring. The first one is the institutional framework, which is the SSM um, and specifically, you know, just taking on this, this understanding that we, we need a complete national data set at the learner level. So we need an individual learner tracking identifier. I think, you know, until we have that, any, any figures we report on dropout just cannot be deemed to be accurate. If a, at, at present, if a learner moves province, there is no way at the high level to be able to track that that learner did not in fact drop out. So, and specifically moving across, so HEMIS, I mean, CMIS and um, SSAMS. SSAMS is obviously was developed 
to focus on classroom administration, whereas CMIS was designed um, to be a district monitoring tool. So these sorts of things fundamentally affect the way things like attendance is collected. Attendance for CMIS is something that's only recently been introduced as tracked at the learner level. Um, and as we've shown with our, we have um, piloted several early warning systems and helped all those excellent organizations to develop early warning systems and uh, implement for their context. We just have to have that data at the learner level with a, a learner tracking identifier. And obviously this, given the um, you know serious protection issues at stake and protection of personal information, this needs to be situated within the DBE where it is safe and secure. Um, then we need to ensure that all required indicators are understood, universally defined, properly used and captured on SA SAMs. Um, you know, particularly there is not consistency in the way that behavioral uh, information is captured um, across any of the provinces. It's these sort of things we need to make sure are universalized and that the full institutional framework, the, the data framework is in place. Then the second thing is to facilitate the implementation. So there's the frame, which is just basically a, a question of definitions and structure. Um, but then it's the implementation of data practices. It's really building this evidence-based approach in schools. Um, so it's not only data collection, completeness, correctness, um, and all the processes that, that go with that, which I think are working effectively, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awareness of the value of data of school management teams to do their own jobs well and to really shift the needle on learners experiencing success at school. But then it's also the infrastructure and human resources. In some of the material that we generated, we identified that, you know, particularly in some of the very rural schools in Mgungundogu, for, for example, you need more than one computer. Um, you know, principals will frequently go um, for meetings and take a computer with them. So it really is focusing on the, the real nitty gritty of off the ground um, uh, infrastructure required and human resources. So as we were saying about crowding, crowding people into schools to be able to facilitate this process, we believe that we could establish a learnership which could sort of carry the campaign, the definitions and understanding of these indicators. Um, also some information on how to use an early warning system what it means to risk profile learners, which would all be automated, and then what to do with the outcomes of, um, of you know, the, the risk um, analysis, and then how to design school design and implement school level interventions. So we've been referring a lot to building an early warning system. I mean, again, we have a functional EMIS. We're in a good position to do this. It is the next logical step um, is to build analytics on the EMIS that we have. It's really about the right indicators at the learner level, and then to design this risk assessment. Already the dropout, there is a, an early warning system for dropout uh, available to principals. They receive uh, push notifications or emails every Friday. Um, but at present, the system is only built to look at chronic absenteeism and only in the provinces that um, use SSMs. So, you know, if we could make something like that comprehensive and include a fuller range of indicators, it could substantially empower us to be able to prevent dropout, reduce disengagement, and get uh, teaching and learning really working well. Um, so, and then it's creating the time and space in schools to track these ABCs with the ability to assess the interventions that they create over time. And then finally, the third recommendation is to focus on this provision of psychosocial support. I think this is something that's just absolutely critical. For me, the key piece of analytic research that we did was we did a, a correlation analysis to figure out of all the organizations who was having the greatest effect um, and why. And the strongest correlation we found was not so much program dependent. Obviously, you know, the support you're providing is highly significant, but it was having somebody there continuously that made the single biggest difference to reducing dropout across the project. So the status quo is that we know there are a range of policies and processes and some good work being done. White paper six, um, the psychosocial support strategy, but we don't see these explicit plans yet crossing over into the district level conversations. We don't see the schools um, properly taking this on 
Um, and, you know, it would be great to, to really see the care and support in schools chief directorate, um, you know, being able to more fluidly and comprehensively leverage the um, SSMs and EMIS infrastructure. So we hope to see a national psychosocial support strategy linked to an early warning system. We hope to see a, a data, a, a risk strategy, which is informed by data and can then channel and really create this targeted national delivery. We hope to see that the distribution of services could be informed by this risk analysis that's conducted. And in time, I think what's really required is to develop an intersectoral referral strategy to really bring a, a lot more health and DSD resources into the schools to be able to provide for this uh, psychosocial gap. I think, you know, they, often I found that, you know, the difficulty with this, I mean, it, it creates a lot of complication when you get to talking about the intersectoral level. And I think it's important to stress that this really does have to be located with, with, within the DBE. They, there's unrivaled access to children. There is the potential to, de to develop a relationship, which health and DSD, you know, they sort of, when you're speaking about prevention, health and DSD will have engagement with the children almost when it's a bit too late. Um, so that's why, although we're talking about crowding these services in, we really need to situate this within the, the education system where there is a strong institutional as well as a data framework. So I think that's it. I think we, we have the potential for real impact with learning outcomes. And thank you all very much for giving us this opportunity to present our findings to you. It's been an absolutely brilliant project. And I hope that you will also take the time to go and view some of the resources which are available if this has sparked your interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to you too. Um, without wasting any time, DM, can I hand over to you? Chen? Uh, uh. Yes. Can I Good morning and good morning to. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I am leading the department. It's just that I, I forgot how does the program look like because after this, I thought that as a department we are going to present the analysis of learner dropout rates as per what transpires at schools. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation by the dropout campaign and the. Uh, they, 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 they give more highlights on what should be incorporated, of course, in our programs. But uh, I think now we can allow the department okay, to, to present the teachers here, to present on our own analysis. Because on the issues of dropout, okay, I don't want to enter into that debate that much because uh, we know that now due to COVID-19, as many learners in some provinces have not come back. And as we think we are addressing it, but it looks like it's a moving ghost because it depends upon the conditions on the ground and in the society and the families. Uh, but uh, we are trying our best as education also, and we appreciate to have partners who will work with us because Issues of drop dropout, it cannot be handled by education alone. It needs civil society, it needs moral regeneration, it needs everybody, traditional leaders, taxi industry, everybody. And if we work together as a team, we, we can put a, a, a dropout rate into zero if we work together. So let's allow the DG to present uh, the perspective of education. Thank you, Chair. Tichi, over to you. Through you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee. Let me also add my voice to what the Deputy Minister said to appreciate the uh, a presentation from a Zero Dropout. Uh, but I want to invite them to come and engage with us. Uh, I've got a team of specialists in the department, curriculum specialists, uh, 
researchers who publish and do research work as their day-to-day -day work. And one of them will be presenting in a very short uh, space. But I must also say, as Deputy Minister said, there are, there are good points from the presentation. Uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, the unique learner uh, tracking identifier it's one important point that I think uh, we'll have to consider, but I think they they could have they could have also uh, maybe reflected on the limitations of their studies, uh, and and one of those is that it takes a psychosocial support lens. It's a very important lens, but in a sector as big as basic education, psychosocial support is just but one lens. Uh, there are a myriad of dimensions and perspectives. Um, and therefore, it might create an impression that uh, um, the perspective is the, the be and all, and uh, it might be a bit uh, problematic. The other issue, before I request uh, Dr. Taylor to quickly share our perspective, is that we have warned, we've warned even academics, researchers, and uh, intellectuals that uh, a linear approach in uh, analyzing dropout rate in a, in, a, in a system as big and complex as ours is extremely problematic. And Dr. Taylor will demonstrate that to you. And a simple example, an analogy of that, and you'll see that many countries do not even take that analysis serious. Um, that, that's how flawed uh, the analysis is to say in grade one, you had so many learners uh, at the exit grade, you've got that's problematic. It's a linear approach. It's flawed, terribly flawed. And one of those flaws um, is to assume that all learners uh, who have not gone out of the exit grade have dropped out. And a simple example of that is 100 people getting admitted in a hospital 50 of them or 60 of them who get released to say, oh, a very good job. 40 or 50 of them are all dead. It's not true. They could be at different levels of recuperation from a medical point of view. Our challenge in basic education, as we have uh, communicated many times, including to the portfolio committee, Dropout rate is a problem. It's a matter that you are concerned about. But our biggest uh, challenge in basic education is repetition rate, failure and repetition rate. And there's a correlation, a very strong correlation between failure, repetition rate, and dropout rate. Now, that's, what, that's when you engage with the complexity of a system as large as ours. But Chair, uh, with uh, your indulgence, I'm going to request Dr. Taylor, it's a very short uh, uh, presentation that he's going to do, and I'm going to request him to quickly just say to the committee to reflect our analysis of what we see in the system. But we appreciate the presentation, and I, I, I would like to invite the team to come and engage with us further to look at uh, how we can put our heads together and take our country forward. Thank you. Dr. Taylor? Thank you, DG, and um, good morning, uh, Chairperson, Honourable Members. Um, I think I am lighting the presentation. Uh, please just let me know if you're not seeing it. You can proceed. We can see it, Doc. Great, thank you. Um, and you're seeing the full screen version of the presentation, or are you seeing the next slide? I see both. Okay, let me just uh, check that. I think it should be correct now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as DG mentioned, um, I'll try and be um, as quick as possible because I think the presentation that we've already received has has really delved into many of the issues around dropout rate and has done a, a really good job. And so uh, I think that's why it has been appreciated so far by, by the Deputy Minister and, and the Department. Um, in this presentation, uh, we're just going to show a, a few uh, of the trends and, and the data around dropout rates, uh, how we think about this in the department, uh, what, what the research says about it, 
Um, we are going to look at different ways of calculating dropout. So in particular, looking at how household survey data can be used, but also at how EMIS data can be used. We will look at uh, the different definitions of dropout. That's going to be an important thing because I think there's a lot of talk about dropout in the sector, and it's really important to be precise about what do we mean. Do we mean dropout rates uh, for each grade, or do we mean uh, something like a throughput rate to how many people actually complete matric? We'll look at uh, a little bit about how South Africa compares to other countries in terms of secondary school completion. I'll also touch on some of the reasons for dropout, but I think that's, that has been quite well covered already today. Um, and just a brief um, thought about potential imp impacts of COVID-19 um, and, and the school closures we've seen on dropout going forward. Right, so we're going to be presenting to the Portfolio Committee on Dropout Rates and, and, and measures taken. Um, <clears throat> so I think we all know the background to this, that, that educational attainment and completion of, of, of secondary school access to post-schooling opportunities is really important for individuals and for the economy as a whole. Uh, we also are well aware of the high inequality in South Africa. Um, it's usually around the release of matric results that these debates um, really get into the public domain. Um, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, there is quite a lot of confusion around terms like dropout rate, throughput rate, the real matric pass rate. Um, and so it really is going to depend on the definition. Um, I think that the, the definition that has been used most throughout today's presentations is, is effectively the proportion of use that do not successfully complete matric could be thought of as, the, as a dropout rate. But it's probably worth noting that uh, the U UNESCO Institute for Statistics, the official definitions of dropout rates are actually grade specific. So it's like the percentage of children in a particular grade in a particular year who, who neither continue to the following grade nor repeat that grade in the following year. So you can work out you know, the percentages that drop out after grade 12, the percentages that drop out after grade 11, the percentages that drop out after grade 10, and, that, and, and that's actually the sort of more official definition of dropout. It's worth clarifying some of the confusions around the so-called real metric pass rate that we, we often see touted in, 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 the, in the media. Um, what often happens is people look at grade one enrollments, perhaps 12 years uh, ago, and then they compare that to NSE passes in the November examinations. And it's important to know that it's just in the November examinations. And uh, in fact, the, the paper referred to by um, Van Brookhazen um, and, and others from Stellenbosch University. It is, a, it is a good paper that we're well aware of in the department, but uh, papers like that also fall into this trap to some extent where they arrive at these figures of about 37% completing matric or maybe as high as 42%. But the approach has a fatal flaw in that the numerator is too low. So the number of NSC passes is too low and the denominator is too high. Um, the denominator being grade one enrollments 12 years ago. And with both of those biases, the overall um, percentage is even more biased because the biases are working kind of in the same direction. Um, and so the problem with the numerator is that it, it only looks at November uh, candidates. It doesn't look at, at other uh, opportunities to, to get the NSC. But the bigger problem is really with the denominator that grade one enrollment is too high. And this is mainly because of grade repetition. So grade repetition is relatively high in grade one. And that amounts to a kind of double count. I mean, if, if for instance, the, the grade repetition rate was 100% in grade one, you would have uh, essentially two cohorts at a time sitting in grade one. And, and, that, and that would obviously amount to uh, a horrible underestimate in the percentage of, of children that actually pass matric if you compared that grade one enrollment rate to yeah. matric passes. Um, and so there are a few other factors which also bias the calculation, but but the, the grade repetition in, in, in early grades is, is one of the main problems with that one. Um, and so there are other ways to, to get at the, the question of what percentage of youths actually complete uh, grade 12. And I think the estimate in the earlier presentation is actually quite, uh, quite good, around 60% um, mm. that was mentioned. We, we see, according to most household survey data, that at least 50% in recent years, it's, it's, it's increased. Um, perhaps more like 56 or 60%, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, whatever me method one uses, we do see improvements over time. So I think that's one um, clear fact that we, we see, however we measure 
um, throughput rates or percentage of youth completing secondary school, there has been a, a, a slow and steady improvement over the years. Another interesting fact is we see more females passing matric every year than males. So the problem is that at this stage seems to be worse for males than females, um, which is significant considering that there are certain uh, barriers and, and causes of dropout which are actually unique to females. So even despite those um, specific barriers, uh, females are, are more likely to reach grade 12 than males, more likely to uh, attain uh, an NSC pass than males, more likely to enter university, more likely to graduate from university than males. Um, this shows some, some of the uh, general household survey estimates over the years. We see, we see improving percentages of, of youths having completed grade 12. Uh, we see the improvements driven in particular by the uh, Black African um, population just big for, for, for equity, but there still are significant gaps between the, the population groups. Um, just a few statistics from, from one study done by um, Branson and others in 2013 using the National Income Dynamics Study data. It's, the data is a little old now. It was data from 2008 and 2010, but they looked at this issue of grade specific dropout rates. So now what, what percentage of children dropping out after each grade. And um, what this graph mainly shows is that uh, the dropout rates tend to start picking up uh, towards the end of secondary school. I think that's a well-known fact that there's not high rates of dropout in, in the primary school grades, but especially grades 9, 10, 11, 12 is, is where we start seeing um, more significant dropout. Uh, this is an, an, another way of, of calculating uh, dropout rates or conversely survival rates for every grade. Um, and we see the same pattern where the percentage dropping out after attaining particular grades that, that increases dramatically in, in grades 11, 10 and 11. Um, we, can, we have also done some analysis, and, and actually it's, also, it's again Funderburg and Al who have analyzed some of the DBE's administrative data, like the annual survey of schools data, to, to get at dropout rates using a different methodology based on the different type of data that is collected there. Um, and there have been some, some difficulties uh, across years um, with, with the data sets, but, but at the end of the day, the, the analysis is not uh, horribly out of line with what the general household survey is estimating. So the, the, the broad trend of, of higher dropout rates being observed uh, towards the end of secondary school is, is coming through however we measure this. Just something on international comparisons. Um, of course, we do wanna see uh, the, the grade 12 completion rates continuing to increase uh, every year. Um, but it's also worth noting where we lie compared to other countries. Um, so our secondary school completion rates are, are similar to other middle income countries, for example, slightly above that of that in Tunisia, Egypt, and Uruguay, but a little bit below what is seen in Indonesia. Um, the next slide shows, it's an extract from, from some research using SACMEC data. Um, so that's a survey of 14 Southern and East African countries and, and what the study did was it, it, it integrated measures of, of access to schooling and, 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 and completion rates with measures of quality of learning outcomes in the earlier grades. And what we see is that uh, where some countries have relatively high levels of dropouts even before grade six, South Africa has, has very high levels of completion of, of primary school and grade six, but relatively low uh, average learning outcomes. And so um, the nature of our challenge is, is more about improving the quality of learning outcomes in the earlier grades in order to improve our throughput rates uh, towards the end of secondary school, whereas in other countries, the, the issue is more about providing access to schooling um, in the first place. Reasons for dropout were discussed in the previous presentation um, in quite a lot of detail, drawing mostly on, on qualitative methodologies. Um, we've looked at some of our data sets to see quantitatively what are reasons given. Um, the reasons given because of the nature of these kinds of surveys are, are fairly uh, crude measures, but at least it's, it is nationally representative. Um, what we see uh, for, 
for for grades sorry for for age seven to fifteen year olds where there's not very much dropout. Um, disability is still given as a as a reason, but but one has to interpret these reasons given um, cautiously because this is this is reasons provided by by household respondents. Um, so it's not it, it's not sort of an objective measure why people dropped out. For instance, we still see quite uh, quite a lot of people uh, referring to no money for fees when we know that uh, I think it's about 70% of South African children now benefit from fee free schooling. Um, what is what is crucially missing from from general household survey analysis is the ability to to measure the extent to which um, learning earlier learning outcomes were predictive of of dropout rates and um, I think we we do have other other data sources which suggest that is a is a very strong predictor even if it's not uh, the only factor or even if it operates in in, in an interaction with other factors um, as as the previous presentation highlighted. Um, Branson et al. Find, find a number of reasons um, for females, pregnancy and family responsibility still is a, is a often cited reason. Just going to keep going. Um, some thoughts on, on grade repetition as a cause of dropping out. The, the DG mentioned that it is a complex interaction of these factors in a large system. And, and, and so there is this question about uh, does, does high levels of grade repetition actually cause dropout? Uh, I guess the theory there is that um, repetition could discourage children because it could it could make them relatively old for their grade, um, so that other options uh, might become more attractive than staying on in school. On the other hand, it's it's theoretically possible that grade repetition can have a positive effect if if in fact it 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 leads to improved outcomes and remedial support. Um, in reality, it's very difficult to measure the causal impact of grade repetition on on dropout rates. Um, because grade repetition itself is already influenced by, by in particular, weak academics, which also causes dropout rates later. So we're a bit uncertain about the, the, the exact extent to which grade repetition should be seen as, as, as a cause of dropout. But I think there's two, two obvious points that we can make about grade repetition. Firstly, that we should primarily understand it as a symptom of weak learning rather than as a cause of educational problems. So repetition and dropout rates should be seen as, as symptoms of, of weak learning outcomes in the earlier grades, and, and that should be where the ma major focus goes. Um, secondly, um, it, is, it is clear that where we see high rates of grade repetition, this is an inefficiency in the system. It, it leads to higher class sizes. Uh, it, it leads to effectively more years of, of public spending on education to achieve the same outcome. So I think we, we're well aware in the department uh, to try to reduce grade repetition where possible to get it down to more efficient levels. Um, so we've discussed much of the reasons for dropout, but I think the local and international literature suggests that, that it's a combination of circumstances, um, not necessarily one isolated uh, cause that, that is usually the case. Um, the ministerial report of 2007 was actually quite an important um, piece of work on the topic. And there's a number of studies that, that have shown the strong predictive relationship between earlier learning outcomes and later um, educational outcomes like, like pass metrics. So um, the, the one, one study a few years ago looked at uh, TIMS data from grade eight and, and try, tried to trace uh, candidates into metric a few years later. And what was clear was that performance in grade eight maths and science was strongly predictive of firstly reaching metric Secondly, passing metric, and thirdly, performance in key subjects in metric. So, the earlier learning outcomes are, are, are strongly predictive of, of metric outcomes. Um, we saw also the study mentioned by Branson and all focusing on the National Income Dynamics Study that not keeping pace at school also was related to dropout. It's worth noting that females have have this advantage, despite there being several goal-specific barriers and causes of dropout. And I think that is in line with the idea that, that academic uh, foundations are important because we do see, especially in recent years, um, that girl learners are performing better than boys, especially in literacy, but even in maths and science, uh, in studies like Tim's, the, the, the performance, they have not caught up to boys. Um, and we see, we see many female advantages when it comes to learning outcomes. Right, as we keep going, so obviously this year has been um, 
uh, yeah, been been quite something. And and one should ask the question: what what is the effect likely to be on dropouts, amongst other things in the sector? And I think there might be reasons to expect short term and long term impacts. We don't yet have any data to measure this. Obviously, we we don't know what the impact will be, but there might be some short term impacts based on disengagement that has happened this year. Um, with a lot of school time lost, um, then this may have have uh, you know contribute to the, the push out factors that 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 we've already spoken about today, um, and uh, and so I think that that just points to to the the need for us now that schools are reopened to to really minimise further learning time uh, losses this year, but there could be long term impacts as well. The, the effect of 2020, um, especially in the early grades. Um, we do know from, from from local and international studies that that this kind of, of large learning loss in the early grades tends to be predictive of lifelong outcomes, like completing secondary school by even going further to, to labor market performance. Um, we've seen in, in a, a nationally representative household survey, the NITS CRAM survey, that we've seen unequal losses of school uh, uh, attendance. So we've seen in, uh, in the more affluent households, We've seen higher levels of attendance, in particular um, when in the grades that were closed at a, at, a, at a time. So it seems that um, we, we we may have a, a multi-year process of recovery now on our hands, um, which which we need to take seriously if we're going to reduce dropout rates in, in years to come. So in conclusion, um, I think as much as the causes of dropout are, are complex, as has been discussed today. Um, we do need to deal with the, the sort of root cause, the, the most fundamental predictive issue of, of weak learning foundations, but at the same time mitigating the, the triggers of dropout, the factors that actually do push uh, or cause disengagement towards the end of secondary school. Um, we and, and as I think the DG also alluded to, you know, there are other pathways as well, um, other than an academic national senior certificate, and so strengthening those other pathways. Um, is, is another important priority. Um, and so the recommendation is to, is to note this analysis and, and to discuss also measures to be taken to reduce dropouts, especially in light of the current um, COVID-19 crisis. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and DG. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Over to you, uh, Deputy Minister and Chair. Chair, thank you. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, DM, DG. And uh, thank you very much to the, um, the presentations that we have, we have received. Now, I'll, I'll allow members to interact. Like I have said, we will allow members to interact with both the the presentations. We now fortunately have got both um, perspective from dropout campaign and the, and the department, which then makes and gives us an opportunity to reflect um, on, on what we have heard um, from both of them. The hands that I have noted uh, now is Honorable Mashesi and Honorable Sukars. Are there any other hands? There is no was a honorable chair. Honorable. And honorable King Chair. <clears throat> King Shabalala. Shabalala. Shabela. Masabela. And Suela. Suela. Sure. Okay. Can we allow Honorable Mashesi to start? Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, I also would like to thank um, the Zero Dropout um, for their presentation and also to your department for also their presentation. I uh, just have, um, you know, a couple of questions. But first of all, I think, you know, I would like to appreciate um, what um, Zero Dropout has uh, recommended. For instance, to say that you have to have KPIs um, 
as uh, indicators for specifically for dropout. And I would be interested to find out what the department, uh, if they are willing to be able to take up that and, on your way out, please. And, and consider to make uh, that, um, you know, to have targets on that. And, you know, I know the minister is not here, but uh, it would be interesting to find out if it's something that uh, the department can consider and also to have uh, a budget that goes with that kind of target. Um, and also the individual learner tracking uh, system that you've mentioned, I think uh, that's something that we should have done because uh, if you have to consider that each and every learner that comes to school, most of them, the majority of them, they do have IDs and we should have been using that to be able to track learners. So I think it's something that, you know, we have to take into consideration as the department is to uh, the department to be able to ensure that you know we, we, we do track the learners. But um, I have to agree with the DG uh, also to say that your focus um, as as a, as as an NPO, we are looking at mostly like you know how do we um, how, how do we determine you know the number of learners that are dropping out from the system more than really focusing on what is it that is uh, you know um, causing all the dropouts that we are seeing. Um, but it is, I think it is right uh, on the other hand to be able to say, you know, how do we ensure, how do we know, you know, how many learners have dropped off the system? Because after so far, the department hasn't been able to give us the accurate uh, percentage of learners we are dropping out. All that we are doing is that they are uh, refuting the, you know, the allegation, whatever, the college allegation or whatever data that is coming from the education fraternity and also, you know, uh, uh, different organizations that are saying that uh, we have a very high dropout rate and they are you know um, basing that on on percentages and the department hasn't been able to provide us that uh, those figures so i think you know it's about time that we have a, a target and also that we are able to to be able to say why our learners are really uh, dropping out and what is it that we are doing about it and also for for today, like for for the department to say that we don't have the numbers yet of learners that have dropped out um, due to COVID nineteen, that is also alarming because then that means we only find out when the results of metric are coming out to say how many learners have actually dropped out from the system. So I think the tracking of the learners on daily basis it has to be done from the classroom. And, uh, and be reported and also like then find ways and means of how do you make a follow up on uh, on those learners. Um, one other thing that uh, I think we, we really need to look at, um, and I think like the department has highlighted this, but I haven't seen, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't seen the results that much, it is the early child development uh, phase and also our foundation phase because um, we, if we have to say that, uh, you know, 78% of our learners uh, cannot read for meaning, then that means like, you know, there's something that we're doing, especially on those foundation phases that we are not doing right. The department is not doing right um, to be able to ensure that, you know, our learners stay at school because um, this is very much key because it eventually it affects the understanding of science and mathematics and and how well is our education system is doing and how we can be able to measure the system. Uh, so uh, I, I was hoping that you know today when we have the, 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 the presentation from the department, we would have had some kind of report on those kind of development like in the foundation phase, because it was somehow if emphasis, but I, I don't know how the department is able to be able to measure, to say like, you know, are we really uh, making any progress in terms of uh, foundation phase? Uh, these are how our figures looking at. I know that you know at the moment we are on the COVID um, on the COVID crisis, so which makes it very difficult for us to be able to do that. But it will be interesting to see that you know the measures that have been put in place, if there were measures that have been put in place, if they are they are they are resulting to anything that we can say it is fruitful. The other thing that uh, also the department has said is that um, uh, also just to add on to say like you know, just again to repeat to say. Um, I would like to see from your side, is it true that really like, you know, what is, according to you, what is the actual percentage of learners who are dropping out? And also you've said like, you know, um, according to UNESCO, the upper secondary education completion rate of South Africa has been similar to that of middle income countries. Uh, so South Africa is one of the middle, middle income uh, countries and, and so, uh, can you please maybe give us the details on like to say like, you know, how, what is it? 
comparison on the high middle on, on as, as a country to say like you know what is it that we uh, in terms of if we compare with other countries how are we doing in terms of the dropout because do we put to actually see like to say that like you know okay if you say that we are 50 percent 50 percent dropout can we compare that with other countries especially those countries that you're talking about from the unesco to say how are we doing in terms of that um and also you know when we were the digits spoke about repetition uh repetition eventually would mean that there's gonna be more learners in one grade than normal and that should be that will be actually be reflected within the classroom and classroom sizes that we're having. But we are not seeing that. And I think that's why, you know, people eventually say that, you know, the dropout rate is uh, is very high because we are not seeing that resulting into the, the the expansion of our classrooms. So I don't I don't see how that can actually be seen as a like, you know, a one of the reasons. Okay, it's true, a repetition does happen. I'm sure it happens, but I think eventually it leads to uh, dropout. So um, and maybe in the industry can be able to elaborate more on that. And also the fact that, um, that uh, we'll be like, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, there are policies that have been put in place. We have a policy for multiple examination, uh, uh, opportunity, multiple opportunity examination that didn't work. And, uh, but now we need to see more policies that will ensure that, you know, our foundation's phase works well. Uh, is there any policy that you know I can that question can be both for drop out and also for basic education to say what policies can we bring into uh, in in place to ensure that our foundation phase is uh, is more like you know it actually assists uh, in the dropout rate. Thank you so much. Honorable Sukar. Honorable Chair, may I ask that, um, I'm here, Chair. May I ask that I just uh, keep my video down because my internet is a bit unstable. Is That's that fine, Chair? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I also just want to um, add my appreciation for the presentation. Um, and I have to say that coming from the constituency period and visiting schools, um, we can clearly see the impact of the pandemic on school attendance. And you can see a trend of um, what possibly we're going to be facing um, if we do not have interventions um, to, to retain learners. Um, I just have a few um, questions that I want to add. Um, the first is that it is, it is becoming clearer, I think, to all of us that data is very important in term for us to understand the extent um, of the of the full extent of the problem when it comes to school school attendance and therefore i want to ask the department um, how much is being put aside for research for us to fully understand you know what is the the full extent um, of the dropout rate um, within schools and then the second is around um, the, the interventions that are being mentioned, and, and it comes again to data. I have a concern that we are asking more of, a, of teachers, administrators at schools, specifically your poorer schools, that does not have the capacity um, to, to, to um, get more um, data to monitor, to, to get research, or not, not research, but really to, to get the data that is being required. I'm, I'm asking the question, are we not putting a further burden um, on a system that is already overwhelmed um, when, we, when we request, um, you know, for teachers and schools to do this? And I'm referring back to my um, constituency visits where I found principals being overwhelmed with the amount of administration um, and feedback that they need to give within provinces. And if we now add this um, to, to, their, to their load, how much of that is really um, going to, to be effective? Um, can we ask more of teachers? And then in terms of the issues around um, the Amy Lee video that, uh, or story, we we ha we have brought this up 
previously chair around the National Senior Certificate for Adults, NASCA. Um, certainly, we can look at this program now um, because next year we are going to have more learners that does not complete matric this year. So the National Senior Certificate for Adults certainly can um, be a program that we can uh, that that is uh, equivalent to the matric qual qualification, and it does cater for learners who have so-called dro dropped out. So my question really is um, the DBE that the existing matric programs does not meet this need. Um, and can we, you know, um, fast track the NASCA? It is critical. Um, and I, I'm asking the NGO that presented um, if they have any comment on the impact that the implementation of a national senior certificate for adults um, would have in, in ensuring that learners who dropped out can acquire a metric equivalent qualification. Um, The other uh, point that I also want to make is that it is said that teachers cannot attend to the needs of all their learners because of the heavy workload. I've mentioned that and that the pressures of school calendar coupled with the impact of large class sizes and the administra administrative work that teachers are doing are simply not able to adequately assist learners. Um, and one example for me around that uh, that also affects dropout is your learners that has got learning difficulties. Um, that has ADD or ADHD. We have set, we sit with learners in schools where there is a problem and the interventions to address those um, or to assist those learners do not come fast enough. And so you have learners dropping out. And we specifically in the Western Cape Chair, we see this a lot where you have children with learning difficulties that falls out of the system. Teachers cannot cope with um, you know, with the additional assistance that needs to be provided, and those kids fall through the cracks. So, we, in terms of the, um, how do we how do how, how do we um, transform our system, or not transform, but really support the system in order to get early interventions for children with with um, learning difficulties? Because unless we do that, we are not going to. Um, not going to retain the most vulnerable learners that can fall into um, social social um, ills such as gangsterism and the like. Um, I also want to just know how has the COVID pandemic impacted um, the work that implementing agencies do? And this is specifically again for the NGO. Can you share your experiences, especially uh, specifically here in the Western Cape, which has been um, severely impacted by by COVID-19. By COVID then um, my final question is again, and it may be a repetition, but much of the information that has been presented, and I've highlighted this in the beginning, um, much of the information in the presentation by the DBE is out of date and not um, uh, for matching periods. Some of it is over 10 years, and I think um, the presenter uh, uh, mentioned it. Um, you referenced the study from NITS that is from 2010 and wave two, um, yet NITS is now on wave five. Could you tell, tell me if the DBE allocates enough money to research? Um, can we as the uh, portfolio committee ensure that, that we allocate, if, that the money that is being allocated every year are spent, spent in a manner that is research based? And I want to emphasize that because obviously if you do not um, have the data, you cannot um, track and you cannot evaluate, evaluate properly and you cannot monitor uh, properly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and I thank uh, uh, the presenters uh, for their very interesting work. Uh, I just want to uh, maybe after thanking the presentation say uh, well, we, we are on ground as of now, and uh, we, we have been witnessing uh, the, 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 the huge loads that uh, teachers are confronted uh, by in schools. And uh, one must, in, especially because of uh, Corona, and one must get the uh, assurances really uh, from uh, the uh, deputy minister and the uh, uh, DG present there that um, 
indeed there is going to be ongoing assistance uh, in terms of assisting teachers in schools. Sometimes it's the fault uh, lies with the department that does departments, provincial departments that do not respond on time. Sometimes it's because of maybe uh, the principals of schools themselves uh, who are uh, uh, somewhat getting used uh, to, 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 to the pandemic, something uh, 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 that is very in, um, imaginable. Uh, but it's as if we, 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 we are back to normal now. Uh, it's not that new normal which we have been talking about. So the department uh, must give us some assurances that uh, they there is always going to be uh, proper monitoring and assisting uh, 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 those that are most vulnerable. Uh, in the conclusion, <clears throat> I just took uh, one uh, point which says, uh, the department is uh, uh, going to try everything possible to protect time and keep teachers in schools. Uh, that sounds very good. Uh, uh, one would agree uh, with the department that we, we need to do that. Uh, but, you know, as, 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 as we do that, let us make sure that um, teachers in particular work under conducive circumstances. Uh, I'm saying they, they must work under conducive circumstances uh, because of the very first point that I, I, I mentioned earlier on. Uh, if, if, if circumstances are not conducive in schools for teaching and learning, uh, what we, we will end up getting is not only uh, people who drop out, uh, but we will also uh, get people who will be affected uh, psychologically, both the teachers and the learners. Uh, I just wanted to raise those two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable King. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, it is really insightful um, to see how much research actually went into to um, learned dropouts. Uh, my first um, point will be to say that um, I totally agree when you say that we need an individual learner tracking identifier, um, and that should then be linked to the to a system that, like as you mentioned, the intersectoral reference um, strategy. Because what we see with SSMs, as you rightfully said, it is class-based, but it is not basically linked to the health department and social development. Hence, we cannot keep track of those learners already um, who's got health and underlying conditions, which can have a factor and a bearing on the educational needs. Um, and, and I totally agree with that because when we were educators, we actually asked that it be linked in that regard and also to keep track of, of how they stay absent when they get sick, because then it makes it easier for you to, to give proper um, assistance where it is needed and redirect those learners. Instead of being dropouts in the long run, redirect them into another sphere of education. Um, what I've also noticed is that our national progression policy um, needs to be reviewed. Um, as you are aware that when you have to, when a child is going to repeat, it can only repeat once in the face. What that then cultivates in is that most of these learners are then pushed through the system. Um, they haven't mastered the content and yet they have to go to another phase where they haven't even mastered the previous content. So if, if when, you, when you did your research, um, what's consideration um, given to how the curriculums, um, how can I say, the lack of the curriculums being more effective for everyday demand that is going on. Will that then have a bearing on school dropout? Um, because you do find that learners um, who cannot cope in the mainstream fear, they feel left behind. Um, it doesn't cater to their specific needs. In South Africa, we've noticed that we mostly focus on the academic child or the sports child that we're forgetting that we've got multifaceted learners. Um, 
And yes, we do have the general education um, certificate that's being introduced, but still in most cases, we need to have a tracking system to see that after they've ex exited the education sphere, at least when they go into a TVET college from grade 10 onwards, that we still keep track of those learners so that they don't fall part of the unemployment rate that we have with our youth. So I would like to know if that has been done. Um, another thing that I've picked up, um, you would find that learners that are on um, social welfare, uh, most parents would enroll them in the January year, but then come October, November, these kids drop out. Um, and we've picked up over the years that most parents actually just enroll their learners to go to school so that they can be part of the social welfare payouts. Um, so I would like to know if the department have actually done some research where they actually looked at which months um, do most of the dropouts actually happen. Because I know it won't be in a January space, but um, if they can actually do some research on that and then they link that in with social development, then you would find um, an interesting trend that is also happening. Um, with psychosocial support, um, my concern is, is that the policy on white paper six is there, it is well um, put out, um, it's clearly written, but the inconsistency in its implementation is what's hampering um, most of these learners having access to most of the psychosocial support um, systems. I know in the Western Cape, the district school um, based teams, they are very effective when it comes to social support. But the problem that most of the schools have are with the learner support assistance, the LSAs. Um, because as in the Eastern Cape, I know in KZN, the LSAs are just merely matriculants with no background on how to deal with um, psychosocial support and providing any assistance to learners. Um, do you think it is still effective that we use LSAs um, at schools? or should we look at a different way of how we can give so psychosocial support to individual learners? Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say, I totally agree um, with you, with, your, with the KPI, because if something is not measured, it doesn't get done. And that will then give us an idea, to an indicator that will tell us at these various intervals, this is when learners are dropping out, this is the type of support we've given, these learners over time. And this is the interventions we've put in place to rope these learners back into some form of education. So I totally agree with you when, when you talk about making it a KPI. Thank you. Ms. Abalala? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, my take is that I would like to thank the presenters of the uh, dropouts, um, but there was one area where I was very much interested when they said um, the girl child, they are most likely to pass metric because I know the challenges of the teenage pregnancies that is uh, tearing the, the, the schools apart, that uh, over and above that, but the girl child is still the one who passed better than the, the boy child. But I would like to, to encourage the department uh, that maybe we need to look in terms of the, the child-headed household, how are those, and followed up with those students, because we'll find that most of them, they are ones who are affected in terms of the dropout and, and other things. So, Chair, I, I would like if then the department maybe can have a special program that will be focusing on the child-headed household. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chairperson, I, I just want to make a few inputs on two issues here. Uh, most learners don't drop out because they are lazy or disinterested in schools. We are conducting a regular oversight. We know what is happening on the ground. The reality is the issue of poor infrastructure, 
water and sanitation, which the department failed to address for the past 25 years. These are the reasons for dropout in South Africa. Because, uh, Chairperson, even now during COVID-19, we're doing oversight, we're doing oversight every time. Most schools uh, are closed now. Learners who are going to experience a lot of dropout because of the issue of infrastructure and water and sanitation. So what I want uh, uh, here, uh, Chairperson, the issue of rep great repetition, I think uh, there is a need for remedial educators. All schools need to have remedial educators in order to deal with slow learners in schools in order to 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 to, to reduce this uh, great repetition i think the Masabela, Honorable Masabela, are you still there? She's breaking up, ne? You are breaking up, Honorable Masabela? She's completely lost uh, mm. of the radio chair. Yeah, she's gone. She's gone with the wind. <laughs> Chairperson, should we take uh, Honorable Shubela, who is next on the list? Yes. Yeah. Chairperson? Chairperson. You can proceed, Tatezuela. Yes. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and and, uh, and and good morning to everyone. Let me also appreciate the, the presentations uh, that, that were made and equally indicate that there is an emphasis on learner tracking system. But I thought that the SHMs or LIRIDs, I stand to be corrected, were probably designed to, to track learners. And again, the classroom attendance registers and quarterly registers are instruments that are meant to, to give feedback to the department to, to, to track learner uh, 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 attendance as well. Perhaps what, what, what should probably be done, it's, uh, it's an emphasis on actually analyzing the information that are coming from those registers to actually determine who actually is coming to school in order to make a proper follow-up. But again, what I would also want to, to, to know is uh, what are the contextual factors besides what the NGO has dropped out as, as provided? I, I can see that they talk about push factors, pull factors, and, all, and so on. But there's no mention of what these push or pull factors are. Probably I should ask of them to provide more information, actually, what do they mean that these are the push factors? 
Actually, these factors are probably if they can shed more light on that one. Thank you, Chair. Actually, done, Chair. I don't know if, if members were, were able to, to catch everything that Honorable Sibela raised. Because... Chair, person, I'm actually done. No, we did not hear anything, yeah. Chair. Yeah, I. <laughs> That's the challenge as well. Uh, Honorable Suela, you you broke as well. So hey. we couldn't we yeah. couldn't really uh, clearly can you just roughly um very brief raise again what you were you were raising. Okay, Chairperson, I'll just simply raise the question. Uh, uh, there is a there is emphasis on learner tracking systems. Uh, and uh, I just want to know whether or not the SASMs or LURIS was not designed to actually do that. Is it not enough to, to track learner attendance at school? Thank you. Got my question? Yes, we, I got yeah. your question. There yeah. are actually three, Chair. Yeah. Is, is raised three questions. The last one is the contextual factors, the pull and the push factors. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Did you... And the other one was about analysis of the information from the registers. Yes. I got all three of them. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's correct. And then um, is the fighter back? Not yet. Any other member, or must we proceed? Chairperson, Honorable Adwins has also indicated a question. Can we give over to her then, Honorable Adwins? Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. <coughs> uh, good morning to all the honorable members uh, present, uh, the DM, the DG, and all staff members that are in the meeting. Uh, Chair, um, let me also take this opportunity and appreciate the work that has been done by the zero rate uh, dropout uh, uh, campaign uh, people and also the, the presentation from, from the department. Uh, Chair, without um, repeating what other members have actually alluded on. I would just uh, ask few clarity seeking questions uh, that I feel that uh, the two presentation was, was silent on. And I think on my side, it is a concern because of uh, some of the issues that are seriously affecting not only our schools uh, affects all uh, our communities or our uh, South Africans. Um, Chair, the first thing um, that I, I've noticed that uh, it was actually not highlighted, it is um, some of uh, the, the data or, or research that was not was not done or was not a part of this it and it it is a reality of what we we live in in this country i would make a practical example about the criminal factor of a, of the young young people or that affects young people whereby most of um young young boys 
or, or boys. Uh, in fact, uh, in some of the juvenile rehabilitation centers or or prisons. Uh, I think also we, we should get some clarity on whether they, they were also accounted when they, this uh, research was done, because uh, I would make an example. There is a, a juvenile center here by uh, the area that I live in, in Clegstock, uh, whereby you would find when you visit it any time uh, during the year or during the week, it is always full of it's, it's young people under the age of 18. It is always full. And you ask yourself, uh, you know, why, how are they actually being assisted or what kind of a support are they getting when they are in those kind of uh, situations? Um, that is the first uh, uh, point that I, I, I think I need clarity on. The second uh, point that I also uh, want to talk to, and I think this one, the, the department or education has tried to actually intervene. It is the, the poverty challenge that we have amongst uh, our poorest of the poor in uh, communities. Uh, that uh, mainly in the past, uh, there was a lot of uh, dropouts because of that, that uh, uh, children could not even focus in school because sometimes they are hungry, sometimes they have to go and leave school and go and find a job so that they can uh, 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 get something, you know, to, 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 to provide for themselves or for their families. And also in some of the uh, childhood families where there are orphans, where there are no uh, parents or parents have pa passed on, uh, it has been a challenge and at, at some point or a level, I see the intervention of the school nutrition program has assisted in keeping learners in school. Of it, I, I think it should be appreciated and uh, also be supported, you know, uh, by all of us to say it must continue to, you know, uh, to grow in all schools and maybe even like, I, I think at some point we received the report that there were other stakeholders that now were coming in so that they, uh, the department would try to achieve in giving learners a breakfast and lunch uh, so that uh, they, they remain in, in, in school because some of them, those are the only meals that they have uh, for the whole day. Uh, both reports or presentations spoke about uh, failure and repetition being part of the, 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 the dropout or leads to being uh, learners being dropping out. And I would even uh, also support and, and, and acknowledge that uh, I think that is the true reflection of some of the, the factors, mainly in, in our rural areas. Uh, I think they are highly affected, our public schools. But what I'm not hearing is how is the uh, the, the, the private schools uh, 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 environment doing on the issue of the dropouts, if they do have at what uh, level and percentage wise, and also what is it that the public schools can learn on, on, on assisting our own uh, the government schools to actually uh, uh, improve on it, especially on the issue of uh, support. And Chair, I would also uh, support the the individual learner tracking system. I think it's what the department should invest in, uh, especially from uh, the foundation level to know when a child is born and where that child would end in school and all that. And I remember at some point, Chair, we, we deliberated on the issue when we were dealing with, I think it was a budget or something of the department to say, how do you track the resources that you invest in schools in a learner a particular to say this learner will have spent this much and this is, a, or maybe all through the year until metric. And this is how we are able to track and say, we are making impact a, as the education or not. And, but also what a, I think was not even mentioned in the report is the issue of uh, the learners that will enroll in January 
uh, that are from other uh, 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 countries. And immediately after that, they take material and they leave the country because in some of the countries, uh, they, they must buy those materials and some are in the country illegal. So the time when certain documents are requested, then the, the child uh, will leave. So also they add into, I, I believe that they add into the number of, of, of dropouts. I think those are some of the improvements that I think it must be added. So as and when we, we as, as a portfolio committee recommend on what is it that's supposed to happen, at least we have that fully fleshed information with us to say uh, this is the proper guidance that we, we need to recommend that uh, the department must take. But this one of the individual learner tracking system, I, I fully support and also the uh, making it a KPI of the department. I think I would want to hear the department uh, in their response uh, reflecting on that. I thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and also thank you very much to our presenters. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Advance. I I will just raise a um, um, few issues. Uh, of course, I've already acknowledged the, the presentations. Maybe to just get clarity from, from, from dropout campaign, because I see the department is um is is using SA SAMs and, and MS to track the, the data. But probably I've missed yours um to just clarify how are you how are you um tracking the the the, 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 the data um of, of, of dropout but as well in your in your in your presentation or on the on the on the slides um there is a slide which is um, referring to the fact that you are having discussions about the care and support in the schools um both uh, provincially and 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 nationally and I just want to find out, um, are you doing that um, in, together with the department? Or, or um, do, you, do, you, do you consult probably the department and do that together with the, with, the, with the department? I'm raising that because the department is also having, um, on their program five, they have your, your social cohesion. And actually, that is that is my question. Does the two um, link link together? The reality with the the, the drop out, um, it um, it's it it has been there. It's 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 it has been there in the system. It has been coming for 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 quite some time, and. Um, I've, not that I'm not I'm not saying that the recommendations um should not be looked at, but the reality is even now if we look at the 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 kids that are going to drop out, fine we can say it's because of the the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, but I think the the weakness that we have in the country is that we are not able. Um, to track them in the near future, we are not able to track them. Where where are they? What are they doing? Um, how much has that affected um, the 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 country? Because there can be many factors. You know, there can be many factors. Um, probably yes, infrastructure is one of them. Um, but I think there are many factors that make um, kids to drop out uh, from school. It might be that they are losing interest as well. So um, those are just a few things that um, I, 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 I'm interested in. But also, in terms of provinces, which provinces, and I understand the issue of quota and the numbers that we have in provinces, but which provinces would you say that they experience mostly um, or are affected mostly by the by the by the by the dropout 
And my questions really are, are really for, for dropout um, campaign. And we are now at two minutes past 11. And I would first give dropout to give responses as quickly as possible. And then after that, uh, the department can, can follow suit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson, honorable members. May I proceed with responses? Yes, please. Okay, that's fantastic. So I will address the responses in the in the order that um, I have them written down. Um, although, you know, we'd like to stress, Honorable Gigaba, Madam Chairperson, your um, questions are very important to us. So it'll be nice for me to get there once I've summed up some of the technical questions. So I think, um, you know, the first thing I'd just like to stress is that um, as a point of clarity, Madam Chair and honorable members, I think our work is by no means a summative or qualitative, um, you know, summative work of, of the qualitative information. In fact, um, you know, all the material presented today uh, in all the presentations, we covered, studied and analyzed the same studies as those featured in the DBE presentation. So I think it's great news that we're all working, um, you know, across the same material and the same data and agenda. And I think I can't stress enough the importance of that point that we immediately aimed to work out the UNESCO definition. So, so you know, we wanted to understand dropouts at each of the grade levels. And as such, our entire project was aimed towards monitoring school dropout um, at that level of the class, according to the UNESCO definition. It was um, a challenge for us when we realized that that information wasn't available. Now that's not to say there isn't the channels for it to be available or that people aren't making an effort. The dropouts should be captured. There's space for it in SASAM. The problem is, is that the nature of dropout as an, indi as an indicator is that it has to be completely coherent. Currently, if a child moves from the Eastern Cape to Johannesburg, he may or may not be captured as a dropout. There's just sort of gaps in the system. So I'm pleased that we're in agreement um, and that the, that the correct definition is, is absolutely key. So now I'll go to uh, Honorable Manchesi. It was a question about early learning. And I think it's something that was raised frequently in the department presentation as well. Again, we wanna stress 100% that that, um, you know, that um, Correlation between uh, success in early learning uh, correlating with successful school completion, it's absolutely valid. It, it is part of the reason why our multi-pronged approach includes a lot of similar work um, in methodology, looking at reading for meaning. Um, it is absolutely critical, um, and I think that I agree. But at the same time, you know, the the thing we need to stress is that dropout can take place at any level. You can have a learner with very very strong early learning. Uh, disengaging later on. Um, I think we need to be very cautious about considering dropout is a, is a senior school problem that then we can plug in a teaching and learning intervention at the foundation. You know, also that these are not um, competing aims. If we can address the disengagement problem, then all the teaching and learning interventions, including the early learning interventions can get better traction. And also if we strengthen our data systems and our ability to assess how well children are doing at a very specific and pinpointed level, it will add value to the um, to the early learning uh, and, and reading programs, and in fact, any teaching and learning interventions. Then Honorable Suke, in fact, this is a query that was raised by Honorable Suke and Kobo uh, and King regarding the burden on teachers. Um, and absolutely, I think this is 100% uh, a valid concern. Um, you know, the, the, one of the questions raised was um, learners with special learning needs. And I think it, there is absolutely no doubt that teachers are burdened, but what we're talking about here is building a system which will enable them to work smart and not hard. I think in the transitionary period, there's definitely a level of support that is required. Um, however, the hopes are that once you have sufficient data on learners, you can save teachers a lot of time in the trial and error of having to diagnose problems. 
So for example, if you have an excellent referral mechanism with a functional school-based support team, it is not going to be the teacher's responsibility to you know, have the trial and error in the classroom of trying to identify what the problem is. She can refer learners for the support that they require. And basically she can, she can target her attention and she can get on with the, or he, he or she could get on with the, with the business of, of teaching and learning. But again, you know, we don't underestimate that this is a major undertaking and that there is an element of support that will be required, which obviously has um, budgetary implications. Then I think um, I'll come back to the one on repetition. Uh, linked to that as well is um, Honorable King, uh, your comment about the learner support agents. So this is um, very, this is a, a valid question about the role of learner support agents. Um, what we, uh, the, one of the case studies we presented to you was of the National Association of Child and Youth Care Workers who worked primarily in the Mgungun Lawu district. And their model was about coupling um, their child and youth care workers, which is an excellent uh, qualification that's been developed by that organization and which really works very well when applied in the um, social development context. So they coupled their child and youth care workers with an LSA in every school that they worked in. Um, you know, there is a kind of a double trauma that takes place, people offering psychosocial support and particularly in schools. So we found that that coupling, it gave this extra element of human resource which enabled both the child and youth care worker and the LSA to enrich the work that they did. The child and youth care worker was involved, um, you know, in a lot of the one-on-one -on -one interventions, which we find are very necessary. And the learner support agent would um, bring in this additional element of enriching activities, um, you know, which also helped to in improve morale and just, um, you know, build, build camaraderie and a sense of safety amongst the children. So there was a lot of, um, you know, not as intensive one-on-one um, -on -one work, but also sporting activities and fun after-school activities. So LSAs, any of those kinds of models, any of those kinds of people that we have in school, I would go so far as to say, you could do a kind of a three three member team of an LSA, um, an administrator, because that the data element is difficult and uh, potentially, you know, some uh, child and youth care worker or a secondment from DSD, some, some kind of model like that. Um, then, sorry, my, my handwriting is a little bit messy here. Just give me one moment. Okay, this is key. I think uh, one of the topics I did want to touch on is the, is the question of repetition. So we've come a lot about the role of repetition in all of this, and I think you know, the this is this is really how we hit on the on the problem of disengagement is that you've got teaching and learning and poor learning outcomes and learners repeating. And it is exactly, you know, there's a lot of time spent. I think there was one study released by JET which found a very strong correlation between repetition. I think we do need to have another look at the progression policy, but I think it is difficult to do that until we can crack the nut of teaching and learning. And I think in turn, cracking the nut of teaching and learning would be a, a lot more easily achieved if we are implementing those kinds of strategies with highly engaged learners. But again, these are not competing or sequential. I think to kind of, we go into a kind of theoretical infinite regress if we try and find out what causes what. The point we tried to make in our early diagram is that this is a cycle of disengagement. It's poor teaching and learning and repetition and low morale and self-esteem and challenges in the home life you know, um, you know, a lot of the, the product of um, communities living under the, under the pressure of poverty. So, I mean, I think that's just it, is that repetition is a major, um, you know, sort of spoke in the wheel, and it is something we need to look at, but I don't think that this is, um, you know, in any way at odds with, with anything that we presented here today. Um, okay, so then the other thing, Honorable Suela asked about, is it not SA SAMS and LURIT? Um, and I think, yes, absolutely. These instruments are things that are excellent. I mean, I would say by my review of a lot of the um, uh, education management information systems, so EMIS is from other countries. South Africa is really flying the flag in that regard. I think we have a lot of strengthening to do, um, but SSMs and LERTS are exactly the tools that we're referring to. These are the instruments. 
But again, it's that 100% coherence that we need to work on. It's to be sure that if a learner moves from the Western Cape to the Eastern Cape, we know that, that we are able to track that learner. Um, these softwares, when, when they are in the development stage, they're usually developed for uh, a very specific purpose. You know, and now I'm talking about, um, you know, the sort of really technical aspects of software development. And I think that um, each one in its own right is excellent. SSAMS for what it was meant to do, and I really look forward to seeing the improvements. I'm not sure where, where that is uh, up to. Um, it, you know, as a classroom management administration tool, and same with CMIS, which was, um, you know, it was, um, CMIS was designed more at the provincial level for sort of allocations and that sort of thing. But through those developments, and this happens when you develop any software, you know, things start to creep in later once you've been using it for a while and you start to think, oh, I wish it could do this and I wish it could do that. And I think that is the stage where we are at now. And I think there are excellent um, people on the job, but that's just something that I think that this committee could really get behind. And just um, facilitating that, the technical term is interoperability. So these um, different softwares can, can link up better for that 100% uh, cohesion. And then um, with regards to Honorable Suela's question about the contextual factors and the push out and uh, pull out factors. So um, I will just quickly share my screen. Um, so this is one of the um, papers that was produced as part of the, um, the campaign. This was a piece of work uh, conducted by um, a, a very highly esteemed uh, researcher. It is a, a sort of comprehensive um, review of all the different causes and where they come from. So you'll see a lot of the, the papers that are referred to elsewhere are referenced here. And this will basically give you a very strong sense of how these, how these factors were analyzed, how we managed to pull it together from really what is a comprehensive uh, local and international um, you know, a set of, of research papers, and it really breaks it down into the different categories. We've got family factors, individual factors, school factors. Um, this is available, um, and I will definitely ask my team to uh, allow this um, gathering to have uh, access to that uh, more directly. Um, uh, Honorable Adunes, we talked, she brought the, the topic of um, you know, the, the a sort of violence element. And I think that this is something that we, we could definitely consider in the long run. I think, you know, when it comes to um, an intersectoral address, we really open the space to be able to speak meaningfully about, um, about um, how to bring in many different data sets. Obviously there's a lot of complexity in that because this data is extremely sensitive, but, you know, I think that what this, what that question basically does is it really just brings up something that is apparent to us, which is that this form falls into a much broader debate uh, about focusing on violence against women and children. Um, I think for, you know, in the initial stages to focus on the data that can directly impact on learners, such as health and social development, but, you know, in time to be able to also consider in, in a broader violence prevention agenda you would want to increase that intersectoral uh, collaboration with uh, police and um, uh, Department of Justice in time. But I think that's definitely, you know, long-term, very, very high level goals. Um, and it speaks to a slightly different side of, um, you know, the same kind of uh, issue. And then um, finally, uh, my response to you, Madam Chair, um, is, um, so how did we track the data with the schools? So basically what we did was we would put in formal requests at the district level uh, to access the data that we needed. And in some cases we were successful. It frequently came in different formats, which made it quite difficult to, to do a kind of comprehensive analysis or to do an analysis that was comparable across provinces. Um, you know, we found, I mean, uh, you know, the, the different provinces um, you know, sort of the, the way that they process the data is, is slightly different. The problem is, is that once you receive data at the provincial level, it is, and please, we did go through all the formal channels to access the data we needed. And we were trying to get data along the lines of the ABCs. Um, but what we did find is if you are accessing data from the district level, 
you're already too far removed from the learner level. There's already a lot of data that you can only get at the aggregate level. So if you want to pick up if a certain child is disengaging from school, you need to know how many days each term that particular child has missed. And in a lot of schools, the convention is that although the teacher has a register, that is never captured electronically. The teacher will take um, an aggregated figure to the principal and then that, and so the aggregation continues. So a lot of our frustration was that we had the highest hopes of being able to really get into the nitty gritty of of dropout, you know, and I think every all the researchers who work on dropout, they do a really admirable job of trying to figure out the dropout level from the data available to us. But, you know, I think our key message is that it's not the same thing. And until you have that data at the learner level. So we use the SSAMS data and the CMIS data um, and, you know, where we were able to get it, um, it was great and helpful, but there were a lot of gaps. I, uh, we conducted a baseline study where we tried to get all of the data for all of the classes in which our uh, NGOs were working. And we managed to get some of the data, but same thing, we could, we could um, graph attrition, but we couldn't make conclusive comments about the level of dropout, even at the baseline level. You know, the, some of the principles have a grasp on it, but at no stage are they consistently putting that up onto either SSAMS or CMIS. And then the question about do we engage with the DBE? I mean, I think one of the one of the key things we would like to do is build a strong relationship with the DBE. I think because we were working on the ground, our eye was very much on the provinces where both our NGOs were encouraged to uh, liaise with the districts in which they worked. There was a lot of work done at that kind of level because obviously that's where we needed the permissions and the access, um, you know, to be doing the work that we were doing. Um, and that went up to the provincial level. We tried extensively to engage with the provincial departments. Um, we engaged with obviously the principals and the teachers, and that was a very informative experience. I mean, I think it's, you really get a different view if you're that close to the ground, um, but we would certainly appreciate the opportunity to develop a system for an ongoing engagement with the DBE on these issues and to support this in any way that we can with, with the human resources that we have available. And then the final question in terms of the provinces that were that were most uh, adversely affected, I think that is a very difficult question because I think um, dropout is a, is a very broad issue. And there's definitely the symptoms and the process that you witness in the Western Cape where, you know, there's, um, there's gangsterism and disengagement, you know, becomes more difficult because the the day-to-day -day challenges of the learners are difficult. So they can't stay after school for psychosocial support activities because it's actually not safe to walk home after a certain hour. Whereas in the Eastern Cape, for example, if we're in you know, some, of the, some of the areas, not peri-urban, some of the rural areas a little bit further outlying of, of um, East London, the challenges there are completely different. And the learner disengagement, you know, when you speak to the learners has a lot more to do with you know, their, their sort of uh, perceived potential for success in general. And there it is a lot more about sort of um, low learning outcomes than immediate threats to their safety. So I think there's a lot of differentiability between provinces. Um, and I think that is just why the, the data approach is something that gives us a systematic way of understanding the differentiability. Because this is not a problem that we can address by implementing one program that's gonna remedi remediate everybody's teaching and learning needs. This helps us to say in this province, these are the challenges people are facing. And in this province, it's more a case of this. And then to tailor make that support, which I think speaks strongly to, you know, a high value for money approach to, to addressing the problem. Um, and I have to say that from my experience and, you know, the sort of three, three, well, three four years we've been, we've been visiting these schools is that um, the problem is universal. And I think that children all over the country are um, affected severely and, and equally. And those are learners with special needs um, and even, you know, some of the best learners that, as we've discussed, can get pushed the whole way through to matric without ever actually um, passing a year. Um, thank you. I think I've covered the queries I will. I will hand over to my colleague, Mo. Thank you, Madam Chair and Honourable Members. Thank you, Ms. Biden, and thank you, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, for the questions that we received and also for the thanks in appreciation of the presentation. I would also like to extend our appreciation for 
the way in which we've engaged just really shifting the conversation to talking about the care and support of learners in a real way. And I think that that's starting to really make inroads in terms of how we approach in education. Um, I'm going to address some of the questions that my colleague did not that was specific to um, the campaign. And I think the first one I'll go in on is on a, Honorable Sukas was um, asking about the metric exam for adults, so the national, um, the NASCA. Um, and we're currently actually in the process of working on a modeling research exercise with um, Dr. Martin Gustafsson on the metric fringe and trying to model um, what a review of the previous success of the second chance program, but also access that um, our adult components of learners have to, to that process currently. Um, our understanding and experience from the ground is that people find it extremely difficult, young people find it extremely difficult to navigate that space in terms of access um, and are also still competing with challenges that they face in terms of um, in their communities and, 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 and accessing the appropriate mechanisms or systems to be able to, to be successful. So understanding that deeply would be um, very important and we'd be very happy to share that report with you, to share our findings once that modeling and research is complete. Um, and also to come back and present that to you if you'd, if, if you'd wish us to. Um, you were also asking us around COVID-19 adaptation of our work, and definitely for all of the NGOs working within our campaign, the adaptation moved to uh, being able to provide some form of connection for learners while schools were closed, especially, and also to respond to immediate needs that were arising for learners at risk in their home spaces. Now, our school spaces are often the space where we're able to um, diagnose that, to see that in learners, and with that being taken away in the space that learners are not able to come into the school space, finding alternate mechanisms to, um, to identify that was necessary. Um, and so a lot of at-home learning strategies were put into place. For example, you did ask um, Honorable Sukas specifically in the Western Cape. We've been working with the Western Cape Education Department quite closely in developing an at-home learning strategy for learners at home and supporting parents on how to engage with learners um, in terms of facilitating learning material, but also how to protect the mental health of learners while they're at home. What kind of conversations to have with your child, how to um, support your child through navigating some of the factors that were playing out within households just because of the impacts um, that were amplified by COVID-19. And so um, some of that, uh, you know, translates into support packs that were delivered into homes, also facilitating kind of outdoor, in the street, um, homework support, um, or follow-up phone calls to parents and, and learners directly, especially those that were identified as high-risk learners, to ensure that we're able to quickly re-engage them when schools reopen. Um, also supporting schools and being able to manage that kind of work. So the work definitely adapted and shifted onto that approach. We also shifted our Reading for Meaning program onto a WhatsApp platform that, that allows parents and learners to access um, literacy and catch-up literacy programming um, that they are able to implement at home with very basic resources and facilitate that through um, the, the WhatsApp platform on their phones. And so we've also tried to engage with other organizations that are working within the field of literacy to be able to use the guided resources um, that makes part of the, uh, that uses the teaching at the right level methodology to catch up learners who are struggling to read at a foundational level. Um, I'd then like to respond to the question by um, Honorable Member King. Um, who asked specifically about considering how teaching and learning and curriculum plays into the dropout, um, and also if there is a consideration for TVET. And one of the things I think that my colleague has mentioned is just the potential of being able to predict and track once we have the information available at the learner level for data. But I would just like to add that what we know about learners who are accessing the TVET space who don't have a metric certificate, for example, is that only about 1% of that population um, are learners who don't have a metric certificate. So we are also uncovering in our work that even navigating that space and alternate mechanisms or alternate pathways are still becoming, are still challenging for learners currently. And so understanding that deeper would also be important for us to strengthen that approach. Um, Honorable Shabalala asked us about the girl child being most likely to pass metric. Um, that was presented by DBE and definitely reflected in the research and we do some analysis in terms of the genders that are passing through the system and completing schooling um, and completing schooling. 
Um, what we do know, though, is that the elements or the impacts that impact this engagement or factors that impact this engagement for male children and girl children are different. And therefore, it is so important for us to understand the factors at the individual level so that the interventions we put in place are successful. Um, for example, when we were working in the KwaZulu Natal province um, with the NSCCW, we found the issue of pregnancy being, you know, very um, high and girl children becoming pregnant. And for that reason, dropping out of school, the intervention was linked to understanding what the issue was with the, uh, the education around safe sex but also the education around contraception. And the issue was actually access and learners feeling um, that clinic services were not youth friendly enough for them to use. Um, and, and through the work of this intervention and collaborating with the health sector in that space, there has been a decline in the pregnancy prevalence within the schools that that, um, that, that NGO was working in. And so girl children are able to retain their uh, grip on education. But, Again, I will say that it's important for us to understand at the learner level what is impacting the, the, the learners uh, from the different genders and from the different um, contexts that they are coming from. Um, and then we had the question from Honorable Edwins that was just reflecting on the criminal factor that affects young people, particularly young boys. And I think um, my colleague touched on this um, when she spoke about the interoperability of a data-driven system that will allow us to respond in a way that pulls in all of the different departments in addressing the interventions we need for our learners. I really want to echo that here and just to say that there is such an opportunity that exists in the universal access we have to children within our country within the school space, but also to be able to address and really affect change at a societal level for the impacts that, um, that that really plays out when a learner doesn't have grip on, on an opportunity. And that we've seen that disengagement definitely speaks into that. And so this conversation around um, creating a caring environment, a caring response, a psychosocially informed response that is based in evidence, that is fiscally responsible, and that holds us accountable for every learner within our school, school space, regardless of where they are in which grade. Um, makes it something that is a more comprehensive approach to addressing even secondary risk factors like crime um, that learners could be engaged in, um, and things like gender-based violence, aggression, violence, and trauma, which we know are cycles of trauma that play out in learners' lives. And so encouraging today that we are starting to have that conversation and really understanding that in order to be making the kind of impact we need to see at a societal level, we need to start here first. Um, I think those were all the questions that were directly addressed to us. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair and honorable members. Thank you very much. Can I now allow the department DM? Chair, I don't know if I'm audible. My network is very poor. You are, you are DM. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, want to, as I indicated, want to appreciate the presentation by the zero rates uh, campaign, drop out campaign. Chair, like HOT indicated, would have loved that they should have come to the department that we share notes, we share uh, expertise and practices. Then that was going to be better than for us to meet for the first time with them in the portfolio committee. But uh, the fact that we have met today and they know that what the job that they are doing is led by Dr. Taylor, from now onwards, they will uh, make an appointment, sit down with him. If, if maybe they find a challenge, then HOD is there, whose hands are always open. Chair, I have a very serious concern to members of the portfolio committee, because each time questions are asked, somebody will say, hey, it's unfortunate the minister is not here. Unfortunately, the minister is not here. And if um, if the minister is not coming to a meeting, should the deputy minister not come? Because I take offense. I'm part of the ministry. And when I'm there, it's like the minister is there. There's nothing that will be discussed, which I cannot. Minister, we talk. I know what is happening in the department. And if people keep on complaining, especially honorable matches, that yeah, it's unfortunate the minister is not here. It's an, and when the TPM is, is there, I will stop coming to the portfolio committee as the deputy minister 
even if the minister is not around. That's the concern that I want to raise. But, Chair, uh, th there are many questions asked which uh, the team zero rate uh, dropout ca uh, campaign have answered with, 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 with some way for the department. But issues of dropout, Chairperson, cannot, there can be no one who has a, a solu one solution to that because the reasons vary. And even in provinces, even in districts, the situations are not the same. So if we don't work together, all of us and all other stakeholders and the community, we are not going to win the zero rate dropout because it, this needs even other departments. It needs your police. It needs your social development because some of the dropouts are as a result of drug abuse. I'm not saying that uh, there are no dropouts that maybe as a result of a school, but in schools, there is a relationship between the school and the parents. But in the event par where parents disappear, the school will only have the data that this child is no longer coming, but they will not know exactly where is the child because the, sc the school or the department cannot account for the whereabouts of the child if the child, the child has disappeared and the parents are not coming forward and uh, we can't even find them. Because if we say now we change that uh, the department must go all out and, and, and trace all the learners who are in drug abuse, who are in criminal activities, who are everywhere, it will be very difficult. And there was an issue about psychosocial support after COVID-19. And now where we are, we still take it, we're still in because we're still under the state of disaster. We're still in COVID-19 and they were not yet out. And we, we, we keep on saying as the department, we behave like we're still in level five. And even in schools, that's why we keep social distance. That's why we support our teachers and learners on psychosocial support. And that will continue even beyond the COVID until when we are stable. Still, we are living in the new normal. We are not yet closer to living in, 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 in normal. But uh, I want to give the HOD, the DG, to, 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 to respond on other administrative issues. Thank you. DG, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister and uh, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I've written all the questions and comments, but in the interest of time, if I don't respond to, it, to each one of them, it doesn't mean that uh, I do not take them serious or I don't want to respond. But I was just saying in the interest of time, we'll just select uh, and make sure that I try and do justice because unfortunately, I will not be able to respond to all of them, but I've written all of them. Now, the first thing that um, I would want to uh, attempt to address, and the reason why I don't share my picture is because I want to save the bandwidth because if you use your picture, and you speak, it uh, affects the quality of your, your sound uh, on this virtual platform. Um, SLSMs is under major re-engineering. We are modernizing SLSMs. We're using the NECT to do that. It is now the third year that uh, we've been working on the modernization of SLSMs which would even lead to one information system that is going to be used by all the nine provinces plus DBE. I thought I must, I must just do that. We've invested a lot of money in this, both from government and from the private sector. Uh, and that should uh, at least give an indication of how much uh, we value the, the, the importance of data the credibility of data and making sure that uh, in a digital age, we are up to speed uh, in making sure that uh, we've got uh, real-time data. So we are modernizing SSMs. 
Um, as I said, we are working with the NECT, working with all the nine provinces. We've got an advisory ICT committee that is driving the process of modernizing SASMs. We could come back to the portfolio committee to give an update uh, in that regard. In the same vein, I want to respond to Honorable Sewell's question, uh, which was, is it not uh, what S.A. Sams and Lurits is about, and Lurits in particular, which is the LENA uh, unit record information tracking system, is indeed designed to track learners, but if you are outside our system, it's very difficult uh, to locate you because the system, we interface with home affairs, we interface with the social development, the social security in particular. That's why when we even release our results, we are able to tell you which learners are receiving, what type of grant, et cetera, and et cetera. That's the interface that we have been able um, to create so far. And we are looking at interfacing with all other systems of government and other systems that are that are out there. I thought that it's important for me just to start with that point uh, to indicate that uh, we are paying attention to uh, our information uh, systems to make sure that uh, is up to date. Um, well, whether we, 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 we consider um, dropout rate as KPI, I really don't know. There, there are other quality drivers uh, and, and, and dropout rate is inherent in them. Let me give you an example, which is linked to the issue of the dropout rate. Uh, quality drivers such as the nature of the curriculum, um, uh, quality drivers such as our assessment systems and um, examination regime. Um, the issue of the quality of teachers has been linked to this or quality of teaching including the issue of textbooks and so on. Those are quality drivers that uh, we also use in the system. Whether the issue of dropout rate could be inherited in those or some of the indicators that are linked to um, either your, your, your um, throughput um, or yeah, your throughput or your completion rate a dropout rate could be inherited in, in, in them. Whether you want to deal with it as a single KPI, I'm not sure if it's, inherit, uh, it's, inherit, it's inherited um, in, in, in any of the quality drivers that I've referred to. Uh, the issue of um, a dropout rate due to COVID-19, I think we have presented to the portfolio committee. We can uh, uh, come back again. We are collecting data on learners that are not accounted for ever since the reopening of schools in our one-on-one -on -one meetings with the uh, uh, provinces, which are starting tomorrow for this uh, next round. We are collecting that data and uh, we are working on improving the uh, credibility of that data. So we are collecting data on learners who are not accounted for um, ever since the reopening of schools. Um, and there was an issue about um, uh, what are we doing in ECD and the foundation phase in terms of making sure that those learners uh, are able to perform in the fundamentals of the, uh, the subjects or the learning areas that they are offering. We're doing a whole lot of things, such as focusing on numeracy and literacy. Um, uh, but also I need to indicate, uh, uh, Chair, that uh, maybe what we might have to do as Honorable Suela advised is that uh, we need to analyze the data much more closely and, and, and uh, move towards digitizing, which we have done. Um, in terms of our business processes, we have digitized. Maybe in terms of issues such as the register, the attendance rate and all of those, we need to digitize them so that uh, information becomes easily available. Uh, what the president uh, has indicated, uh, in fact, which will come out very soon after the cabinet quota, is that we will be appointing um, close to about 900,000 uh, 
additional young people to the system, particularly of quintal one to three schools. And, and some of these young people would be used to help us uh, check up our systems and collect uh, this data that I'm referring to. Um, and therefore, I think it will go a long way in, in giving us real-time data with just the click of the button, we'll be able to access data that uh, we, we desperately need. Um, and I think after cabinet quota from government, uh, those details in terms of, that's why when uh, the president spoke yesterday, he referred to as uh, uh, some of the job creation uh, initiatives that are going to cover sectors such as uh, basic education. We'll be getting an average of about uh, up to 900,000 young people who will be, will be employed uh, in, in, in education only. Um, and then the, uh, there was an issue about the increase of learners. We have this data, by the way. We can ac actually show you by grade as to where is the, that's why Dr. Taylor was able to say, don't use grade one because you've got up to 30% repetition rate. And some of those learners are under age. They are kept um, by schools, although um, uh, it's illegal for them to do that. We picked it up. They are under age. They come to, to either grade R or grade one uh, much earlier than what is expected. And they are kept there uh, for a year or two. And therefore, using that um, as a point of departure to, to determine how the system is performing at the exit point. And that, that in, in, in inflation of numbers goes up to even grade two, sometimes grade three. Um, and, and that's why we are saying um, it's, it's not really advisable to, to use that. Anyone who uses that data uh, should know that uh, 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 the credibility of it um, in terms of projecting what comes out of the exit uh, point of the system will be highly questionable. And then the multiple exam uh, opportunities, um, yes, indeed, it's one of them. And I also want to say to Honorable King, although uh, I hear you, Honorable King, about uh, national progress progression policy uh, that says that learners should not spend more than four years in a phase, countries such as the UK and others is automatic progression. That's why you won't talk about repetition there. In many countries, they've moved away from the notion of repetition. In fact, they've also moved the notion of past failure. It's outdated. If we move to competency-based curriculum, competency-based uh, assessment, we will give you a report card that says you are performing at this level in these areas of skills and knowledge and so on. Instead of saying to you, you have passed or failed, you have to be retained. I mean, many countries don't do that anymore. And I think uh, we've spoken about that. I think uh, the Council of Education Ministers um, made a very progressive announcement in terms of the foundation phase to say automatic progression there. Because by retaining learners also, you dent their image. And some of them, um, um, the, um, um, uh, that might be dented forever. They might not be able to perform better than, you know, what, what they would have reflected for the first time. I mean, researchers and psychologists uh, put together a body of knowledge around this, which is actually discouraging retention of learners. Um, and then the Honorable Sukar, um, yes, I agree with you. In fact, I've indicated that we are collecting data also in terms of uh, learners who are unaccounted for ever since we reopened schools after the lockdown. I've highlighted the importance of data and our investment on SASMs, LURIDs, and uh, all our information systems. Um, Dr. Taylor is here. I can't give you an exact amount of what we've invested in research. We're doing lots of research, we're collaborating with universities, we're collaborating with NGOs, uh, we're collaborating with other entities. Uh, Evidence-based decision-making is what we follow. And that's why the reopening of schools was based on that. That's why we even won court cases because our decisions were based on research and uh, empirical evidence that is uh, in the department and out there carried by varied, uh, you know, various bodies 
that are doing this research. And we appreciate what um, the, the, the zero rate uh, dropout is doing. Uh, and that's why I said we'd want to engage with them. But um, I find it difficult that uh, uh, one of the members said we operate at provincial level, we're engaging with the provincial department. But when it came to sharing this information, they came straight to the portfolio committee and not to the to in the National Assembly and not to the Provincial Portfolio Committee. I think they could have also engaged with us, but the Deputy Minister, you know, touched that point. Going forward, I think we'll work together. Uh, Honorable Sukher, a small, just a humble correction. We no longer say learners with, uh, who are experiencing learning difficulties. Uh, we actually saying learners with barriers to learning. Uh, you might say to me, what's the difference? The difference is that uh, learners do not necessarily um, yeah, experience difficulties, but it is barriers uh, that are probably creating challenges for these learners. And these are the barriers that we need to address. And I agree with you that we also need to uh, really look at this. CIAS is a policy that we use to identify various barriers to learning. We've got uh, school-based uh, teams, we've got district-based teams and uh, uh, provincially, yeah, uh, uh, based teams that, that we use uh, for the implementation of um, uh, the CS policy, which should help to, to really identify barriers to learning. And for all learners, by the way, in fact, uh, uh, the notion of saying barriers to learning, it mainly for learners with disabilities, I mean, UNESCO has uh, conducted a research which indicates that those learners constitute le less than 2%. The bulk of the barriers lie with learners who are outside the confine of learners with, um, uh, 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 learners with special education needs. So they, they also need attention. Honorable Ngobo, I fully agree with you. I, I'm sure you'd be happy, Deputy Minister. Well, was in KZN, I think, uh, a week or so ago. Saturday and Sunday, I spent uh, uh, the weekend in KZN in um, Mkanyakute. I visited 10 schools there, looking at um, how principals and schools are supporting learners, uh, grade 12, but other grades. And we moved to Ugu, which is in the opposite, in the south toward the Eastern Cape. Um, we also interacted uh, with officials, school principals, and teachers. We are humbled with the work that is being done. And I agree with you, the environment has to be conducive also because it could contribute to matters that we are discussing today. Uh, Honorable King, so I've, I've spoken to the issue of the national uh, uh, progression policy. I think we need to amend this policy to bring automatic progression across because it's not the fault of learners that they don't meet uh, uh, the requirements of the fundamentals for the next grade. Uh, um, I mean, systems in the world have acknowledged that it's the fault of the system. And it's incumbent upon the system to make sure that learners meet the requirements of the fundamentals. If they don't, that's why you have foundation phase those requirements can be met within a phase and not necessarily a grade. And therefore, uh, that's, that's the approach in my humble view that, that I think we must take honorable uh, King. And then we'll look at what we have proposed in terms of the research and uh, the intervals that learners are enrolled with with social development. Uh, Dr. Taylor is here. We'll look at uh, the work that uh, could be done there and see um, whether there's anything that we can pick up. Colleagues from um, uh, the, 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 the um, zero uh, uh, dropout, uh, zero rate dropout, have spoken to the issue of the LSA. Um, and I've been advised that uh, we are providing more support uh, to LSAs uh, so that they are able to bring meaningful uh, intervention in schools and are able to support particularly learners uh, in the manner that would make a difference at, at school level. Honorable Shabalala, issue of uh, child-headed uh, households. 
Um, the chief director, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Watson, is part of the meeting. She's taking note of your point. We will definitely focus on child headed families also to look at uh, whether the challenge is more profound there than you find it uh, in other households. Uh, reasons for dropout, Honorable Mashabella, as correctly articulated by both uh, entities, our colleagues uh, from um, the zero rate dropout and ourselves, we've indicated that there are myriad uh, uh, reasons for dropout and uh, uh, they range from one factor to a number of factors. And we'll do our best that in our quest uh, to provide quality education, we deal with all of these factors to make sure that uh, um, uh, the dropout rate is successfully addressed. I must also say, Chair, we, we, we just need to be careful also about the nomenclature that we are using. Oh. I don't think that the disengagement um, would be permanent all the times. Uh, we sometimes use completion rate, we use uh, dropout rate, we use uh, learner disengagement, and sometimes it's confusing because the nature of human beings is that you might be disengaged at, at some point and a at a particular point to go back to the system. And, and I think we might need to uh, consider using a nomenclature that is much more consistent, which would suggest that you've been completely lost uh, from the system. And, and, and therefore, uh, uh, there shouldn't be confusion around that. Honorable Suela, I've, I've made comments about uh, you. I think the issue of the contextual factors has been uh, addressed by colleagues. I've spoken to the two points that you had raised. Uh, Honorable Ardun's learners in conflict with the law, um, they are accounted by us as learners who are still in the system. Anyone who would um, do a survey and uh, miss this in the analysis, I agree with you. Uh, it might be a gap and uh, well with us, we have a very uh, close relationship with uh, institutions that are handling learners who are in conflict with the law. We work closely with them, we provide curriculum, provide workbooks. We work uh, with them throughout. Um, the issue of um, tracking learners, I've indicated that is part of LURIT. We are modernizing that. And hopefully over time, we should be able with just the tick of, you know, the, you, the click of the button, be able to get real time data per grade uh, um, and per school. Um, Honorable Chair, I think you also raised the issue of tracking learners. As I've said, uh, it's something that we've invested a lot of time, uh, resources and energy on uh, to address. Deputy Minister, I have tried, if there's anything that colleagues would want to add, they could do that. I want to reiterate the fact that uh, we would like to engage uh, with all NGOs, but we, we're very careful because at times some NGOs uh, would come to the portfolio committee so that we get directives uh, through the portfolio committee. In fact, in other words, use the portfolio committee uh, to issue directives to us. And I'm saying, I don't think it's right. The right thing to do is to engage. If we, we are unwilling to engage with them, I think the right thing to do would probably be to go to the minister or even the portfolio committee and say, we've done this work. The department is unwilling to engage with us. But we've seen it with equal education and others. Uh, sometimes when we even disagree with them, they come to the portfolio committee so that the portfolio committee directs us uh, on what to do. And we don't think it's right. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Deputy Minister and Honorable Members. Thank you, DG. I, I, I thought we were going to cover also that education in South Africa is pro-poor. So there was a point mentioned about uh, taking care of learners, but I want to appreciate uh, it's Honorable Shabalala who indicated that there's school nutrition, there's no fee schools, and all those things are meant. And they were as a result of research, which which wanted to know exactly why 
is the high dropout rate. Then hunger and all these other things affected learners and not having school fees and books, etc. Then that's why the, the education system is pro poor. And another thing, the teaching which I thought we we're going to cover is the three stream model. Yes, we are not yet there, but uh, we are e research also told us that we cannot only push the learners on the academic route if they can go vocational and technical. And uh, that is what we are driving now as basic education. Chair, we, we, we want to appreciate this meeting and to know about the existence of the zero rate dropout campaign. And uh, we are looking forward to meeting them in the department in the near future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the MDG and also to the to the dropout um, for the for the responses. We are really uh, behind time. It's twelve o'clock now on my on my watch. Um, but like I've said, thank you very much um, to all of you. And um, hopefully, um, moving forward, there will be at least an interaction um, between the, the the campaign and and the department, um, so that at least there is a bit of of communication. And how can the two um, deal with issues of um how do we how do we move forward but in the interest of time i think let me release both of you um from the meeting so that the committee can um stay behind and be able to to deal with with other matters um thank you very much yeah including the matter of the dm thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> Yeah, can I can I make just one uh, comment before they leave? Yes, Honorable Adams. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, I think we'll be doing a very serious injustice if we are not going to recognize and appreciate the work that has been done by teachers as they were celebrated uh, last. Uh, I mean, yesterday. Uh, I just wanted only to pass that message that uh, we also celebrate and appreciate all the teachers uh, in in our country and in the world. But also, I think the DM must not take uh, Honorable Machesi seriously because there is no uh, uh, deputy a shadow deputy minister. It's only a shadow minister, so she competes with the uh, the minister. So we must not take her serious. <laughs> that was on the lighter note. Bye, chair. Thank you, thank you, DM. No, I think that is that is uh, accepted. Thank you very much, um, um, Honorable Advance, for that. Thank you very much, uh, department and the campaign. We are releasing Thank you now. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Honorable Thank you, Chair. Bye -bye. Thank you, chair. Honorable Thank you, Chair.